I hope you've enjoyed being with us. We've enjoyed having you with us. Good morning. Alan Squires just moved in next door. It's your worst fear. One day along comes this monster and we're prisoners in our own home. Neighbours from hell. How come you two can afford a place like this? Kevin Waitley. Shut up! Shut up! John Thompson. Maybe it's your jealous, right? And Denise Van Outen. We can do what we like. Murder in mind. I don't consider it cruel or evil. Mm, necessary. Sunday at 9 on BBC One. Get caught. Year 1942. Objective, defeating the Nazis. Mission controller, Roosevelt. Fixer, Churchill. There can be no peace without sacrifice. This time, it's the goal. The stage is set for a walk with the devil. The Tangled Alliance continues. Allies at War, Tuesday at 9 on BBC Two. Britain wakes up to an historic second term of Labour government. But what now for the Conservatives? For a hundred years, we've been in government for short periods of time, but never won a full successive second term of office. Now we have. Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast from BBC News with Jeremy Bowen and Sophie Rayworth. The headlines this morning, it's another landslide for Labour. Tony Blair is back in Downing Street with an expected majority of 167, the biggest ever achieved by a governing party. William Hague described the result as deeply disappointing for the Tories. Charles Kennedy's Liberal Democrats get their highest number of seats since 1929. But turnout is the lowest since 1918. Tony Blair has won an historic second term in office with another landslide majority. With some results still outstanding, the projected results show Labour being returned to power with a majority of 167, just 10 less than four years ago. Labour has won 412 seats, the Tories 160 so far, a gain of just one seat, and the Liberal Democrats 46, an increase of six. Labour's share of the vote is around 43%, the Conservatives 33%, and the Liberal Democrats 19%. But the turnout was the worst since 1918. Only around 59% of people turned out to vote. This morning we'll be analysing the results, talking to leading figures in the main parties and bringing you election news from your area. But first, this report from Breakfast's political correspondent, Carol Walker. From the moment the polls closed, it was clear that Tony Blair was heading for the second term that had been his burning ambition since he became Prime Minister. His family were with him at his count in Sedgefield. He spoke of his humility and determination to fulfil the expectations of the voters. And you have given us tonight an historic moment for the Labour Party. For tonight, the Labour Party for the first time in our 100 years of our history looks as if we may be on the verge of a second successive full term of office. And that is an extraordinary thing. It's what we've always worked for, and we work for it not because simply to be in office itself, but because we always knew that in order to complete the work that we began, it would take more than one term of office to do so. By the time William Haig arrived to hear the result in his Richmond constituency, he'd already conceded defeat and telephoned Tony Blair to congratulate him on Labour's victory. He admitted the results were deeply disappointing for the Conservatives, but did not say whether he wanted to continue as leader. Clearly, we in our party must review, redouble and intensify our efforts to provide an alternative government for the country in the future. I will set out my views later this morning on how that process should begin. Will you remain party leader, Mr. Hayes? Despite all the speculation about the leadership, no potential challenger to Mr. Hague has emerged yet, and the man so often tipped as his likely successor, Michael Portillo, has been resolutely loyal so far. I hope that nobody will say anything hasty 
in the coming hours and days that any of us might wish to regret thereafter. I pay tribute to the campaign which has been so skillfully led by William Hague. The Liberal Democrats have been celebrating their best ever night, seizing Chesterfield from Labour, holding seats like Newbury that had looked vulnerable. Their leader, Charles Kennedy, said it was a verdict not just on the government, but on the opposition too. It is also a doubly historic night for the Liberal Democrats in that we have, in all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. One of the biggest surprises was a personal landslide for retired Dr Richard Taylor, the independent candidate in Wire Forest, who'd fought a ferocious campaign against the downgrading of his local hospital. You, ladies and gentlemen. And the way I view this is a tremendous reaction from the people against a very powerful government, against a very powerful political system that overrides the will of the people. In Oldham, the contest was dominated by the recent race riots. Though the Environment Minister Michael Meacher held Oldham West and Woyton, Nick Griffin of the British National Party Six, won a record 16% of the vote. Candidates were banned from making speeches for fear of inflaming local tension, but Mr Griffin later claimed the result represented a protest by white people Meet against you. racist attacks. Which way are we going? At Brentwood and Ongar in Essex, the former BBC correspondent Martin Bell failed to unseat the Tory Eric Pickles. The man in the white suit who famously defeated Neil Hamilton in Tatton at the last election is out of Parliament. But Sean Woodward, who famously defected from the Conservatives and has been given a rough ride in St Helens, held the seat comfortably for Labour. In Hartlepool, Peter Mandelson also enjoyed a substantial majority. The close friend of the Prime Minister, twice forced to leave the Cabinet, spoke of the inner steel that had helped him through when opponents said he was facing political oblivion. They underestimated Hartlepool and they underestimated me because I am a fighter and not a quitter. The Prime Minister has joined party workers and stars for the celebrations at Millbank Tower, Labour's headquarters in London. But there is none of the euphoria of four years ago. There is concern at the low turnout. Tony Blair says he's won the battle of ideas, he has the mandate he needs, and now it's time to get to work. Carol Walker, BBC News. Well, in Scotland, the Conservatives failed to make any significant comeback, but they did capture their first Westminster seat since 1997. But it was a bad night for the Scottish National Party. Its share of the vote dropped. The Liberal Democrats gained ground, but it was left to Labour to take most of the seats. The Scottish Conservatives had pinned their hopes on the former Foreign Secretary, Sir Malkin Rifkin, leading a revival by winning back his Edinburgh Pentland seat from Labour. It wasn't to be. I said four years ago that the Labour Party should consider they had a leasehold, not a freehold, of this constituency. And indeed, that is what it is, but the lease is lasting slightly longer uh, than I would have preferred. The Tories also fell to win targeted seats in Eyre and in Eastwood. But Galloway and Upper Nithsdale, the part of Scotland worst hit by foot and mouth disease, did give the Tories a taste of success. It came after a recount. Another recount in Perth saw the Scottish Nationalists beat the Conservatives by just 48 votes. The SNP have confirmed uh, as the second party of Scotland and that gives us a, a platform of which to advance to the Scottish parliamentary elections in two years' time. The Liberal Democrats had a successful night, holding on to their strongholds in the Highlands and the borders. But it was Labour's night, keeping their tight grip on Scotland. Assad Ahmed, BBC News. Labour's success across the UK was reflected in Wales, where it's lost just one of the seats it won in 1997. The political map of Wales has changed little, with Labour taking 34 seats, Plaid Cymru 4 and the Liberal Democrats 2. Monmouth, the Conservatives' number one target in Wales, is held by Labour. 
The Tories again have no seats in Wales. Meanwhile, two IUC officers and a woman were injured last night after a gunman fired on a polling station at Draperstown in County Londonderry. It's understood the police fired one shot, but the attacker managed to escape by car. One of the IUC officers was wounded in the shoulder, his colleague was hit in the arm, and the woman was shot in the leg. It's believed a Republican dissident group was to blame for the attack. One of the biggest surprises of the night was the strength of the British National Party vote in Oldham. The BNP secured British the National largest party. vote for a far-right party five, in decades, five, two, winning 16% of the vote in Oldham West and Royton, pushing the Lib Dems into fourth place. The party also secured more than 5,000 votes in Oldham East. The BNP's success at the polls follows several nights of rioting in the town involving Asian youths. Well, Tony Blair is back in London after returning from his Sedgefield constituency. Early this morning, our political correspondent, Philippa Thomas, is outside. Number 10 Downing Street, Philippa. Well, as we've all seen, Tony Blair has returned to Downing Street. He says he wants to create a sense of momentum in his second term. But first, I think he wants to get a little bit of sleep. Now, Fergal Parkinson reports on Tony Blair's night. Looking relaxed and relieved, Tony Blair arrives at his constituency Labour Club to celebrate his imminent victory amongst friends and supporters. Although the final result still wasn't known, he was confident he was back in charge. If Tony Blair was relieved, so was the former Conservative MP Sean Woodward, who despite his obvious unpopularity was elected to the safe seat of St Helens South. But that butler story just wouldn't go away. Well, Sean Woodward, um, taking your butler to Westminster? Um, I'm looking very much forward, uh, Jeremy, to being able to represent the people of St Helens after this result for the Labour Party and for everybody who's worked on this campaign tonight. Meanwhile, the troubled Foreign Office Minister Keith Vaz, who's at the centre of the recent passport of row, got his own back to Westminster. To returning to Parliament. <laughs> Elsewhere, all of Labour's top team were comfortably re-elected. Gordon Brown secured his Dunfermline East seat. And Robin Cook was obviously delighted to be re-elected in Livingston. John but it wasn't Alexander, all plain sailing for Melvin, the others. Hemming, there had been rumours all evening that the Education the Minister Estelle Morris may lose her Birmingham Yardley seat to the Liberal Estelle Democrats. Morris, but in the, the end, she managed to retain it with a two and a half thousand majority. And he was the victor in 1997, and this year could so easily have been the victim. But yet again, Stephen Twigg, the man who caused one of the biggest upsets at the last election by ousting Michael Portillo, retained his seat, and his face told the story of the evening. And right at the end of the night, the man who brought the punch into politics just couldn't contain his happiness. We're back! Fogel Parkinson, BBC News. Philippa, in Downing Street, Tony Blair looked very preoccupied at times during the campaign. Was that because he knew that the hard work starts this morning? I think so. It's been remarked upon, hasn't it, Jeremy, that William Hague looked remarkably chipper throughout the campaign, very resilient, very optimistic, and yet he was the man always staring defeat in the face. And it was Tony Blair who looked worried, nervous, a bit harrowed at times. And I think it was because he was planning ahead. He was thinking not only about the cabinet reshuffle, which ministers were going where, what he was doing with his departments, but also I think he kept talking about capturing the imagination of the voters. You know, he really wanted a, a strong mandate and the fact that the turnout has been so low will have been very worrying for Labour. Philip Thomas there in the place where the nation's attention is centred this morning. Number 10, thanks for joining us. And another result has just come in. The Conservatives have held Norfolk Mid. Keith Simpson won with a total of 23,500 votes, a majority of 4,000 over the Labour candidate. Well, the question now is what happens to the Conservative Party and to its leader, William Hague? A Conservative central office is our political correspondent, Nick Robinson. Nick, when is Mr Hague expected to arrive there? He's expected in the next hour, but he may not speak to us or indeed the country at that stage. He's expected to go in, talk to party workers, before emerging, possibly an hour or more after that, to make his intentions clear. Now, he said when he uh, announced the result of his own seat that he had a plan in effect. We simply don't know what that plan is. He's been urged all night 
not to be hasty. Most people in the Tory party want a period of reflection, as they put it. They want to discuss policy. They want to work out why they are so far from the hearts and minds, it seems, of the British public before they have a personality race for the leadership. It is a surreal morning. I was here four years ago when the Tories are decimated. They might as well not have done anything for four years. They are precisely where they were four years ago. Then they had an idea of what to do about it. Now they are genuinely baffled. How much support has he been getting from his shadow cabinet in the past few hours? Well, they are saying don't act quickly. They are praising the way he handled this campaign. They are saying that they share responsibility for the campaign. We know it's a tough old game, Sophie. He's not delivered. He is perhaps an impediment to any campaign to keep the pound. He'll come mm. under huge pressure, if not necessary from the high-profile figures who might wish to replace him. There could be a peasants' revolt within the Tory party. The smaller figures, the lesser-known figures, who say he's got to go. The question is, is he going to jump or is he going to fight? Well, Nick, as soon as Mr Haig arrives there, we will be back with you for now. Thank you. It was the Liberal Democrats who made the most overall gains at their headquarters as our correspondent, Peter Hunt. Peter, their best night since 1929. Yeah, I think they're very happy here. They're very relieved. They had a very careful strategy of trying to hang on to the seats they had and targeting some others, and it's paid off. They've gained six seats, including one from Labour in Chesterfield, uh, several the others from Tories, including uh, the seats of Cheadle, Guildford, uh, Norfolk North. Their share of the vote has increased, and Charles Kennedy set out saying he wanted to increase the share of the vote because he wants to do that for a longer-term battle over this whole issue of changing the voting system, and he wanted to increase the number of seats. He's achieved both of those and has only lost one, so he's a very happy man, I imagine, this morning. There was some talk about them becoming the main party of opposition, a little bit misplaced. Well, I think that really is where the focus will now be, and I think actually, in retrospect, the four weeks of the campaign, frenetic though they may be, will be much easier than the next four years, because once they've had a rest, they've got to put flesh on the bones of this claim of theirs that they will be this moral opposition. They always said that they wouldn't be the quantity opposition. They knew they couldn't outnumber the Tories at this election, but they say, they argue that they'll be Tory in fighting, and so it will be down to them to provide this moral, principled opposition. But it would be a very difficult thing to do, because you've got a Labour landslide, you've got a Liberal Democrat who are in government with Labour in Scotland and Wales, and who sometimes cosy up to them. So that's what they've got to try and establish now in the weeks and months to come, how they will establish this so-called principled opposition. Thanks, Peter. There with the Lib Dems. Let's have a look at the front pages. 60 minutes past six. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. The main stories this morning. Labour win an unprecedented second full term with a massive projected majority of 167. William Haig says there's much for the Conservatives to reflect on after the party gained little ground since their dismal performance four years ago. The Liberal Democrats have had their best result for more than 70 years, gaining six seats so far. Voter turnout has been the worst since 1918, with only around 50% of people bothering to vote. And the front no, pages. Let's have a look at the front pages. No, let's have a look the Daily Express this morning, We Are the Champions is their headline there. Blair romps home and casts Haig's crushed Tories into election oblivion. And this is something that might be on the mind of the Prime Minister and his friends this morning. In the mirror, what the hell are you lot looking so smug about? Get back to work. It's on about 17 pages inside. The Independence headline there, Blair claims his mandate with massive majority. Labour takes second full term with historic victory, but turnout falls to modern day low with voters staying away. The Telegraph. Blair's black with a landslide. Historic second terms, Tories thumped to defeat, Lib Dems gain. Portillo urges Hay not to quit yet, it says at the bottom of the front page. Those three dots perhaps rather significant. Daily Mail, their election special. Father's Day is their headline. Victorious Blair gives daughter a hug, but the real winner, they say, is apathy. I think we've done most of the papers and we've the got here. And the Sun as well. Let's have a look at the Sun. There you go. Blair is back, it says. Labour romps in with epic second landslide. And we have one more paper. The Daily Star, they've ignored the election. Now, throughout this election, we've heard comment and opinion from a group of undecided voters, especially selective for BBC Breakfast. Some of them voted yesterday and some did not. Throughout the morning, we'll be playing their views. And here is our first lot. <laughs> In the end, I voted for the Lib Dems as the credible opposition. I found the Tories to be unelectable and felt that the Labour Party needed to be seriously challenged. I voted for the Labour Party because 
and believe that they deserve another term of office in order to make some more changes. I voted for the Conservative Party because I trust them more and believe more in their policies. I voted Labour because the other parties didn't offer me the alternatives I was looking for. I voted for the Liberal Democrats because Charles Kennedy seemed honest and sincere. I voted for the Lib Dems because I think they're down to earth and sensible. Well, Andrew Marr, the BBC's political editor, has been up all night analysing the results. He joins us now. What a night. An extraordinary night, really, because it was a night where we were sitting there waiting for all these seats to change hands, and mostly they didn't. And yet, if you stand back from that, it's actually a historic moment, because not only in terms of the history books does Labour win this full second term on a massive number of seats, also a hideously low turnout. The lowest turnout in this country during our democratic history. You have to go back to 1918 when women didn't have the vote and people were still knocking the Flanders mud off their boots to find a turnout as low as this. Fewer than one in four people actually voted for Tony Blair and yet he has got this massive Commons majority. Now the big question is obviously what is going to happen to William Hague? Very difficult. Um, I think he set himself some kind of personal hurdle in terms of the number of seats that he thought he could win back. Other Conservatives have talked about their assumption that they'd get anywhere between 25 and 50 seats. Whatever hurdle he set himself, he clearly hasn't jumped over it. The question is, is he going to go now? Now, a lot of the people that you'd expect uh, wanting him to go now, possible alternative leadership challengers, are saying, please don't go. The Conservative Party is in shock, it's in trauma, it's gone through this awful traffic accident. Don't leave us. Let us settle down, ask ourselves what went wrong. So it's, it's a difficult decision for him. Does he walk away like John Major did after the last shattering defeat, or does he stay on but in the knowledge that a lot of the policies and the strategies that he's uh, followed over the last uh, few months and years, when it came to it, simply didn't work. And meanwhile, the Liberal Democrats are going to be very pleased with their, their new gains. Very pleased indeed. Uh, Charles Kennedy has, by common sense, consent, had a very good election campaign. Others have had very glitzy, very carefully stage-managed elections. Charles has kind of wandered through this in a rather shambolic fashion. Um, talking about the importance of more money for the public services. He's not very good at the razzmatazz. And this has worked for him. But with one warning and proviso, he has moved the Liberal Democrats clearly to the left of the Labour Party. And not all Liberal Democrat voters are that way inclined. And one day they may wake up and notice. Now, another huge majority, obviously, for Labour. But, I mean, the question now is, can they deliver what they promised? Can they deliver on public services in the next four or five years? You don't know. I don't know. Maybe Do they they, know? I don't think they know necessarily. They think they can. It's taken Tony Blair quite a while to work out how the machinery of state, all those levers of the civil service, actually work. He thinks he can deliver much better hospitals, much better secondary schools, and a transport system that actually gets us around the country. But he has four years now to do it, and if we're all sitting here in four years' time, and that hasn't really changed, you don't notice a big difference, then I think then not only Tony Blair, but New Labour, the whole project, is in deep, deep trouble. Andrew Marr, thank you very much. Well, it was the issue that the Conservatives fought much of their election campaign on, but it didn't seem to attract the voters. The Euro. Now, it's one of the biggest issues facing the new Labour government. Europhiles want swift action to start the referendum process, encouraging Britain to join the new currency. But there are plenty urging caution. Despite the Tories' best efforts, the Euro never became the campaign issue they hoped it would. Thank you very much. Keep the pound. Yeah, thank you. According to the pollsters, it remained low down the list of people's priorities. European but Labour's Europhile wing says now the election's London's won, the government Europe must move quickly way. towards a referendum. The best chance of winning it is to go pretty soon, to go in the first year, to get it well out of the way before the next election, also in case there's some sort of mid-term dip in the government's popularity sooner the better. In the campaign, Mr Blair and Mr Brown presented a united front on the euro. Their mantra, that Britain won't enter the eurozone until the Treasury's five economic tests have been fulfilled. But some in Labour believe the Prime Minister and his Chancellor are divided on the issue. Gordon Brown 
knows that the economic consequences for Britain are likely to be pretty disastrous, which is why he's so reluctant. Campaigning in his Nottingham constituency, Alan Simpson made no secret of his anti-Euro beliefs. He hopes the government will shelve a referendum. If they don't, he thinks, Labour will be split. Its main task, delivering better public services, will be greatly hampered. I think what Downing Street will have to calculate is do you want to open that divide on day one of a new government which has a mandate to deliver other things? Mr Blair believes Britain should take a leadership role in the EU. Joining the currency is part of that vision. For many Labour Europhiles, it remains the defining issue, the one this Prime Minister will be judged on. There will be lots of cautious people in his party who say, we don't care that much, don't do it. But I think it is his own firm intention to do it. Joining the Euro would have profound economic and constitutional implications. It's also a deeply political issue which will loom large on the new government's agenda. Robin Aitken, BBC News. Well, results are coming in all the time and two more have just come in. Labour have held Kettering, Philip Sawford winning by a small margin of just under 700 votes over the Conservative candidate. And Hampshire North West has been held by the Conservative George Young with a massive majority of 12,000 votes. But what is the weather doing this election morning? Sarah's going to tell us. I am indeed. Good morning, Jeremy. It's gorgeous here in central London. Loads of sunshine around. The wind's lighter than yesterday. It is a little bit chilly. The temperature here in London is around about 9 degrees. And it's certainly a pretty chilly start of the day in some rural areas. The temperature in Benson in Oxfordshire at the moment is just 1 degree Celsius. And it's 3 in Bournemouth and in Aviemore. I shouldn't feel too bad today in the sunshine and lighter winds than yesterday, but those temperatures are still below average for this time of year, around about 11 to 14 for Scotland and Northern Ireland, 16, perhaps 17 across parts of England and Wales. So loads of fine weather around at the moment. You can see the clear skies here on the satellite picture. Just a few showers about, particularly across more northern parts. And through today, the clouds will generally build up a little bit to give a scattering of showers. However, for some central and southern parts of Wales and England, it will stay dry. Those showers very few and far between. Most of the showers will be across northern areas and those showers will gather during this afternoon to give a longer spell of wet weather across western parts of Scotland and parts of Northern Ireland. And the pollen index is still low across northern areas at around 1, but across southern England and East Anglia, it's up at 6. So through tonight, that wet weather will continue to slip towards the south. With more cloud around, it won't be quite as cold as last night, although we could see temperatures down below 3 or 4 degrees in some rural parts of England and Wales. And if we have a look at the outlook, well, it looks like for the weekend, there'll be some rain heading towards the south during Saturday, sunshine and showers on Sunday, fewer showers for Monday and for Tuesday. That's the weather. Sophie Jeremy, back to you too. Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Well, quite a few election results still to come later today, including Orkney and Shetland, where the count was suspended when a plane collecting ballot boxes had to be diverted to take a pregnant woman to hospital. Lots more election stories coming up. This is the place to get the full story of the night's events. Stay with us. But now we join the BBC's news teams across the UK. Good morning from Newsroom South East, I'm Nina Hossein. Well, the Tories and Liberal Democrats have won individual battles in constituencies, but Labour has won the war. Last night, London and the South East looked like this, and now, well, it's pretty difficult to spot the difference. One of the most significant factors in the 2001 election was the record low turnout. The average across London was just 56% and below 50% in some constituencies. Labour held on to nearly all the gains it made in the last election, including marginal seats like Finchley and Golders Green, Mrs Thatcher's old seat. And a 7.6% swing to Labour in Enfield Southgate meant Stephen Twigg held on to the seat he took from Michael Portillo in 1997. The Lib Dems maintain their swathe of south-west London, a total of five seats in the capital. In Kingston and Surbiton, they managed to turn a 56-vote win into a majority of more than 16,000. And in Guildford, the Lib Dems parted through the night after snatching the seat from the Tories. In fact, the loss of Guildford to the Liberals was one of the worst blows on a bad night for the Tories. They simply didn't recapture the number of seats they were hoping for. They managed to keep Labour hands off Uxbridge and Chipping Barnet. 
Outside the capital, Martin Bell, the man in the white suit, was kept out of Parliament by the Brentwood and Ongar MP, Eric Pickles. But there were some gains, and it seems Essex man is gradually coming back to the fold, taking Romford and Upminster in the London borough of Havering and winning Castle Point from Labour. Rebecca Tow reports. The Conservatives clawed back three seats they lost to Labour in 1997. Romford, a predicted win for the Conservatives, was returned to them with a comfortable majority of 6,000 for Andrew Rosendell. Well, I'm delighted. It's a wonderful honour to be elected the MP for Romford and I'm very grateful to the people of Romford for choosing me. I shall work very hard and ensure that they have an MP in Romford that will speak up for local issues. Upminster, another key London target for the Tories, was narrowly recaptured by their candidate, Angela Watkinson. It was very close and I knew it was going to be, yes. So, uh, one of the major efforts today has been making sure that our supporters actually translated their votes in, in the polling booths. A small victory for the Tories in London as it witnesses the return of the Essex man. Rebecca Towers, Newsroom South East, Hornchurch. And in addition to deciding who will be their MPs, many areas have also been voting in local elections. Results on these polls will be declared throughout the morning and we'll have that information for you in our later programmes. Don't forget you can get all the latest analysis of the election results here in the London and the South East in a special programme at 9 o'clock this morning. If you can't get a television, there's also coverage on London Live 94.9. Just before we go, a quick look at the weather. Early sunshine will clear to make way for sunny intervals and light showers. Temperatures peaking at 18 Celsius. Now back to Jeremy and Sophie. This is Breakfast from BBC News. William Hague is expected to return to Conservative central office any minute now. This is the scene in Smith Square at the moment. We'll bring you any developments as soon as they happen. But for now, here's Moira with this morning's news briefing. Thank you. Good, mo good morning. Tony Blair has won an historic second term in office with another landslide majority. With some results still outstanding, the projected results show Labour being returned to power with a majority of 167, just 10 less than four years ago. Labour has won 413 seats and the Tories 162 so far. They've gained just one seat. The Liberal Democrats won 46, an increase of six. Labour's share of the vote is about 43%, the Conservatives 33% and the Liberal Democrats 19 But the turnout was the worst since 1918 with only about 59% of people voting. Well, this morning we'll be analysing the results, talking to leading figures in the main parties and bringing you election news from your area. But first, this report from Breakfast political correspondent Carol Walker. The Prime Minister this morning joined party workers and stars for the celebrations at Millbank Tower, Labour's headquarters in London. The joy at a second historic victory has been tempered by the low turnout. There's none of the euphoria of four years ago, instead a determination to fulfil the expectations of voters. The people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promised that we will do, and they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. By the time William Hague arrived to hear the result in his Richmond constituency, he'd already conceded defeat and telephoned Tony Blair to congratulate him on Labour's victory. He admitted the results were deeply disappointing for the Conservatives, but did not say whether he wanted to continue as leader. Clearly, we in our party must review, redouble and intensify our efforts to provide an alternative government for the country in the future. I will set out my views later this morning on how that process should begin. The Liberal Democrats have been celebrating their best ever night, seizing Chesterfield from Labour, holding seats like Newbury that had looked vulnerable. Their leader Charles Kennedy said it was a verdict not just on the government but on the opposition too. It is also a doubly historic night for the Liberal Democrats in that we have, in all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. Begin. Tony Blair and his wife Cherie are now back inside number 10 Downing Street. 
It's thought the Prime Minister will begin work right away to appoint a new cabinet and to bring about wider changes in the way the government is run. Carol Walker, BBC News. And the Liberal Democrats have just gained Ludlow from the Conservatives. Matthew Green takes over as the MP with a majority of just over 1,500. Voter turnout was 68%. In other news this morning, eight Japanese primary school children and a teacher have been stabbed to death by a man who burst into their classroom. At least 23 children and three teachers were injured in the attack and many of them are still being treated in hospital. The stabbings occurred shortly after classes began at a school in Osaka. Police say a mentally disturbed 37-year-old man has been arrested. James Lawson, the father who killed his mentally ill daughter, is due to be sentenced today at Maidstone Crown Court. He pleaded guilty in May to manslaughter with diminished responsibility after helping his suicidal daughter, Sarah, to end her life. Mr. Lawson and his wife claimed their 22-year-old daughter was repeatedly failed by the National Health Service. In the United States, the Federal Appeals Court has rejected Timothy McVeigh's request to delay his execution for the Oklahoma City bombing. He is due to die by a lethal injection on Monday, six years after 168 people died in America's worst act of terrorism. Timothy McVeigh's lawyer has said he will not ask the U.S. Supreme Court to delay the execution. The FBI has been called to investigate incidents of alleged sabotage of Boeing 737 passenger planes at a factory in Seattle. The company says it has stepped up security at the plant after discovering as many as 10 incidents of suspicious damage to aircraft under construction. Last year, Boeing fought a bitter industrial dispute with its engineers, and in March, the company announced it would be moving its headquarters to Chicago. The result of the Irish Republic's referendum on the European Union's Treaty of Nice will be known today. Irish voters have been asked whether they accept the treaty, which permits the enlargement of the European community. If they reject the treaty, it will be a serious obstacle to plans to allow more countries to join. Reducing ambulance response times to five minutes could almost double survival rates for heart attacks, according to research in the British Medical Journal today. Government targets state that nine out of ten emergency calls should have an ambulance on the scene within 14 minutes. The UK has one of the highest rates of heart disease in the world. Survival rates from heart attacks outside hospital are three times lower than in countries such as the United States. Well, Britain has seen one of the biggest falls worldwide in deaths from testicular cancer over the last two decades. Research published in The Lancet says early diagnosis and improved treatment are behind the 72% reduction since 1979. The figures were better than those of any country apart from Sweden. A pitch invasion disrupted play in last night's England versus Pakistan cricket match at Edgbaston. The players were forced to leave the field for half an hour as thousands of Pakistan supporters swarmed onto the pitch, mistakenly believing the game had been won. It was the first incident of its kind at an international cr cricket match in Britain. And that's the news for now. Back to Jeremy and Sophie. Thanks very much, Maura. Well, it was a good night for Labour in Wales as well as the rest of the country, with Plaid Cymru failing to perform as well as, the, as well as they did in the Welsh Assembly elections. The Labour Party, in fact, gained a seat in Innesmond, but Plaid Cymru took some comfort by taking Carmarthen East from Labour. Joining us from Cardiff is our Wales correspondent, Wira Davis. Wira, good morning to you. Uh, Labour supporters, core Labour supporters in Wales, became very disgruntled during the last government. Looks very much as if they returned to the fold. Indeed, it's a, it's a glorious morning here in Cardiff, as you can see, especially if you're a Labour Party supporter. That challenge you refer to there, that challenge, especially in the South Wales Valleys, Plaid Cymru hoping to, to take up that core socialist Labour vote that's been abandoned, apparently, by Labour Party moving to the right. It just didn't happen. The vote in the Valleys held up. Labour's vote everywhere in Wales held up. In fact, Labour still controls 34 of the 40 Welsh seats. Plaid Cymru still have four. They lost on this morning, Anglesey, as you said, but they did pick up Carmarthen, East and Deneva. The Lib Dems did very well to hang on to their two seats in Mid Wales, but the big losers yet again in Wales are the Conservatives. Not a single Conservative MP returned from Wales for the second election in a row. Quite a disastrous night for a party which has been in the past had five or eight MPs from Wales. So Plaid Cymru not doing as well as they'd hoped, certainly better than the SNP in Scotland, but Labour again basically painting Wales red. 
What are Wells Tories saying about their, their, their second failure? Because you think of all those uh, prosperous parts of uh, the suburbs of Cardiff, the Vale of Glamorgan, places like that, where you, you think there should be a lot of Tories. Indeed, the only place they really came close was, was in Monmouth. That was a, just about an hour and a half ago, the last place in Wales to declare. And they lost that by, by about 1,000 votes. They had really hoped to take Monmouth. It's a rural, English-speaking constituency, very suspicious of the Welsh Assembly, um, a very rural, affected by foot and mouth. The type of constituency the Tories should have easily taken. They didn't take it. Uh, ironically, the Tories, if you take Wales as a whole, not the constituencies, have the second highest vote in Wales. And if there's one time you suggest the Tories should be going after proportional representation adopting this uh, this PR thing it's perhaps now because under the first pass of the post system they're not getting any seats in Wales or, or in Scotland they've just got the one up there of course. Well Davis beautiful morning there in Wales is capital city thanks for joining us from Cardiff. Well the results are coming in all the time the Conservatives have held Blaby with a majority of just over 6,000 virtually unchanged from 1997. Well let's look now at the Liberal Democrats because many commentators thought the Lib Dems had the best of the campaign and once again they pulled off a few surprises. He's been smiling all night, he's been smiling throughout the election campaign and with good reason Charles Kennedy has led the Liberal Democrats to their best election results it's since the 1920s. Torbay. Mark Sanders has been elected for the constituency of Torbay. Uh, this was the Tories number two. It started time. early on the English well, Riviera. Adrian Dems Sanders was defending a tiny majority of just 12. He eventually won by more than 6,000. I am absolutely staggered, stunned, amazed at the size of my majority, 6,708. Uh, it really is the Lib Dems went on to gain seats in Guildford, Cheadle, Mid Dorset and here in Chesterfield, the former seat of Labour veteran Tony Benn. It ends almost 70 years of Labour domination. Labour have just lost the seat after 66 years. He thought he'd got a safe seat. He's been proved wrong. And Charles Kennedy has proved many people wrong. This was his first election as leader and a real test. Although he would never admit it, the Liberal Democrats have been the party of the left in this election with progressive policies like raising taxes and abolishing tuition fees. Early analysis shows some voters were listening. In constituencies with universities, for example, the Lib Dem vote went up by 4%. And we're steadily on your way now, and they're going to have to be the effective opposition, because the other lot are going to spend all their time biting each other's ankles. The question is now, will the Lib Dems be able to bite Labour's ankles? Charles Kennedy has promised he will, but he's looking forward to much, much more. What we've now got to do is build upon this bigger base with a view to, over the course of the next decade, achieving the entirely feasible prospect, which is Liberal Democrats at a Westminster level as part of the governance of Britain. That Thanks is big much, talk and a very unlikely prospect. In his heart of hearts, Charles Kennedy knows the days of Lloyd George are some way off yet. Graham Satchel, BBC News. Now I think we can go live now to pictures of William Haig. He is about to arrive there at Conservative Central Office in Smith Square. He's flown down from his constituency in North Yorkshire. We're not sure whether or not he is going to say anything before he goes into Central Office. Uh, it's understood that he may head straight in and talk to party workers. We know already that he has said party workers who've worked so hard for so little reward. William Hay this morning saying already that his, he is deeply disappointed with the results. Yes, he made a gracious speech in his constituency. He said he telephoned uh, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, to say that he wished him well. He said everybody should wish a Democratic leader well on the morning of an election. But he said too that there was a sobering lesson for all the parties that millions of people didn't participate in the election. The lowest turnout, don't forget, since 1918. As you can see just there, the Conservatives have held Wealdon in East Sussex with a new MP, Charles Hendry. He takes over with a slightly reduced majority of just under 14,000. Well, as we said, William Haig about to arrive. Pictures there live from uh, Conservative, Conservative Central Office. We will go straight back to that as soon as we get it. But now let's return to the Liberal Democrats. Simon Hughes, the Liberal Democrats Home Affairs spokesman, joins us from his party's headquarters. Good morning. Hello, good morning. A very good night for you. A very good night for us, thank you very much. Really the only party of the three major parties that has made progress, significant progress. It looks as if our share of the vote across Great Britain is up. It clearly is the case, as you accurately reported, that our number of seats are up, uh, winning both from the Tories and from Labour. And confounding all of you, if I may say so respectfully, who told us at the beginning of this campaign 
that we would struggle to hold the seats we had. We haven't struggled, we've gone beyond that, and we are now likely to be, going to be, and determined to be, the effective opposition to a government which has got back, but is clearly at its high watermark, and when the Tories, by definition, are going to be wandering and talking to themselves and just not able coherently to talk to the nation or for the nation. Do you see yourselves now as the, the radical party of British politics? We've been the radical party of British politics for a long time. Uh, it's just that we haven't had the seats that have given us, as it were, the political gravitas to go with that. We are now not only the radical, progressive, um, modern, you can call it what you like, party of politics here in Britain, but also we have the ability to put the case. There are enough of us to do it. We hold the balance of power in the House of Lords, we hold the balance of power in uh, the Greater London Assembly, we have members of the European Parliament, we're in government in Scotland and in Wales. The reality is we're not just arrived and here to stay, we're on the way up and we're now beginning to look at being in opposition officially and being in government so, and that's where we want to be. So how soon then are you going to be pushing this whole issue of Europe? How soon do you want to see a referendum on Europe? We've argued that we ought to have a referendum as soon as is practically possible because Britain ought to be able to decide. If you remember it was Paddy Ashdown who first committed us as a party and therefore triggered the issue in British politics as to whether the decision should be won for Parliament or by the people. We say it should be a people's decision. It should have been in the last Parliament. Tony Blair and the Labour Party were as often uh, over-cautious about this. We haven't had it. We want it to happen. But not when do you want it to happen? How soon should we have this referendum on the euro? I've answered that question. I've said as soon as is practically possible. So what, what is big, that, next few well, months? No, no, I doubt that it would be the next few months. It's a matter we will assess as a party. You have to allow the debate to happen. The British public want the debate. It's clear they rejected the Tory idea that you have no debate because the Tories have been rejected. There will be a debate, and I anticipate in the next 18 months there will be a decision by the British people. But you have to have the debate first. You have to have the debate away from the general election. And there are many other things to which this government must turn its attention now, not least the big debate of the election, getting the public services back on their feet so that health, education, policing, transport and the care of the elderly can be adequately resourced and adequately financed. Simon Hughes, thank you very much for joining A us pleasure. this morning. It's 6.45. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. The main stories this morning, Tony Blair declared a night of history for our party as Labour won an unprecedented second full term with a massive projected majority of 167. William Hague said there is much for the Conservatives to reflect on after the party gained little ground since their dismal performance four years ago. The Liberal Democrats have had their best result for more than 70 years, gaining six seats so far. And voter turnout has been the worst since 1918, with only around 59% of people bothering to vote. One of the key questions now is when will the government call a referendum on the European single currency? Uh, the European countries will be watching Britain closely. Our correspondent Angus Roxburgh is in Brussels. Angus, good morning to you. What would our European partners like us to do now? Oh, they would like us to get on as quickly as possible with the task of organising a referendum, uh, hopefully getting through that referendum and joining the single currency uh, as quickly as possible. They understand, of course, that uh, at the moment probably the economic conditions for Britain to join the single currency aren't right. That's what the British government is saying as well. And they support the idea that uh, Britain should carry out these five economic tests to decide uh, at which point uh, Britain will be suit suited to join the, the single currency. But as soon as that happens, as soon as the economies of Britain and the rest of the continent are convergent, as they say, then we should get on with the business of joining. Are they hoping that a more secure Tony Blair, in this, uh, after, backed by this huge landslide again, is going to be more Euro-enthusiastic than at times he's had to be in the previous government? I, I think they certainly hope that. Whether that will be the case or not uh, remains to be seen, but certainly that is the hope. Uh, on two counts, really. One, uh, as far as the single currency is concerned, as I say, they certainly hope that he will get on with the business of joining the single currency. But then in the next uh, three or four years, there's another huge wrangle uh, across uh, the horizon here in Europe over the very future of Europe. Another one of these interminable conferences to decide the future of Europe is going to be held, and that will once again pit Tony Blair against those in Europe who want more integration, faster integration, harmonization of all sorts of taxes and so on. So we can see a lot of argument uh, in the future over that. But at the same time, 
I think it is true to say that they do see Tony Blair as basically pro-European and willing to go along that road to some extent. Certainly they would have been horrified, I think, if uh, uh, William Hague had come to power with his promises of renegotiate, renegotiating old treaties and disrupting the whole uh, uh, European process. Angus Roxburgh in Brussels, thanks for that. We'll also be watching for reaction from the financial markets this morning. Our shares reporter Declan Curry is in the city. Declan, good morning. Sophie, good morning to you. I'll let you into a secret. The share markets are likely to do next to nothing when they open for business at 8 o'clock today. Uh, the latest figures we have from the City Bookmakers IG Index show a 30% rise in the FTSE 100 when trading starts and most of that due to changes overnight on Wall Street. The City has been expecting a big Labour majority, a second historic term for Tony Blair for some time. Uh, those traders in the City who've been placing bets on it have been putting their money on a majority of around about 160 for the last four weeks. So the market has already priced in a Labour victory. So on the broad index of shares, no movement at all today. The place to watch, though, is the currency markets. There is an expectation there that this Labour victory will bring forward the date that the United Kingdom might sign up for that European single currency. That has driven the pound down uh, sharply over the last two days. As we speak this morning, sterling trading at very close to 15-year lows and may well fall when London currency trading finally gets going in the next hour or so. Now, do send us your views on uh, the election or anything else you want to send us your views on. Our email address, as always, breakfasttv at bbc.co.uk. Yes, the people have spoken, but some of them not with a very loud voice, and spoken perhaps by not voting. Did, did, you, did you vote? Let us know why you didn't vote if you didn't bother to go to the polls yesterday. Right now, though, let's have a look at the weather with Sarah Wormsers. Hello there, good morning and it's a gorgeous start of the day here in London. Plenty of blue sky, the sun is shining but it's quite chilly, the temperature just at 9 degrees. Having said that, it doesn't feel too bad because the wind is not too strong. Now you can see on our satellite picture here, there's a good deal of dry and sunny weather around across many parts of the UK at the moment. A bit more cloud up towards the north and already there are a few showers. Now through today, we'll slowly see the clouds building up and they will bring with them some showers, but they'll be very few and far between in southern parts for parts of Wales, central and southern England. It will actually stay dry for most of the day, but further north there will be a scattering of showers. Some could well be heavy and they're going to gather together in parts of western Scotland and Northern Ireland later on to give a spell of more persistent rain. Now those temperatures are still a little bit below average for this time of year, around 11 to 14 degrees for Scotland and Northern Ireland, 16 perhaps 17 across England and Wales. But with lighter winds, if you can get into the sunshine, that shouldn't feel too bad. So some rain is going to head down from the north through tonight. That rain will still be around in some parts of northern Britain first thing at tomorrow. And then that rain will slip towards the south through the day, followed on by sunshine and showers. And then on Sunday, sunny spells, scattered showers, and most of those showers will be in the east. That's it. Sophie Jeremy, back to you two. Sarah, yes, Sarah thank you very thanks much. very much. We'll be back at seven with the latest national picture. But before that, the election news from around the UK. Good morning from Newsroom South East, I'm Nina Hossein. While the Liberal Democrats and to a certain extent the Tories have won individual battles in constituencies, but Labour has won the war. Last night, London and the South East looked like this, and now, well, it's pretty difficult to spot the difference. Labour held on to its huge majority. One of the most significant factors in the 2001 election was the record low turnout. The average across London was just over 56% and below 50% in some constituencies. Labour held on to nearly all the gains it made in the last election, including marginal seats like Finchley and Golders Green, Mrs Thatcher's old seat. And a 7.6% swing to Labour in Enfield Southgate meant Stephen Twigg held on to the seat he took from Michael Portillo in 1997. The Lib Dems held on to their swathe on south-west London, a total of five seats in the capital. In Kingston and Surbiton, they managed to turn a 56-vote win into a majority of more than 16,000. And in Guildford, the Lib Dems partied through the night after snatching the seat from the Tories. In fact, the loss of Guildford to the Liberals was one of the worst blows on a bad night for the Tories. They simply didn't gain the seats they were hoping for. But they managed to keep Labour hands off Uxbridge and Chipping Barnet. And outside the capital, Martin Bell, the man in the white suit, was kept out of Parliament by the Brentwood and Onger MP, Eric Pickles. But there were some gains, and it seems Essex Man is gradually coming back to the fold, taking Romford and Upminster in the London borough of Havering and winning Castle Point from Labour. 
Well, joining me now is our political editor, John Craig. John, will Labour be pleased in the South East? Oh, I think so, yes, because there were some, a lot of very vulnerable seats which they could have lost, and they've held on to nearly all of them. And They've only lost a couple in London and one in Essex, so a good night for Labour. Interesting, a lot of the results are almost identical to what they were last time. Joe Coburn reports now. It was so sweet to win first time round. But believe me, and I'm sure Gareth will agree, to win the second time, to prove the first one wasn't a fluke, <laughs> is really, really sweet. Yeah. Bruising words, but true. It was a double whammy for Labour's boys in Harrow, despite the Tories' hopes of staging a comeback. Their failure to take back Harrow West from Gareth Thomas astonished everyone. <laughs> Labour's delight at holding Enfield Southgate reaching the very top. Stephen Twigg caused the biggest stir of the last election. This time his confidence has grown, as Labour shows that it can hang on to former Tory strongholds. We had an excellent campaign and I was very fortunate to have a brilliant team of people, volunteers, working very, very hard. When it came down to it, no one factor explains the result. We certainly had a number of Liberal Democrats switching to Labour last time and this time. We also had a number of people switching from the Conservatives direct to Labour. Labour's success was repeated across the capital, with losses in just Romford and Upminster. There's one thing for certain. If I hadn't won Romford by Tuesday, Maggie made sure that I did when she came down. John, what about the Lib Dems? They seem to have proved they've got staying power in this area. Very much so, yes. They've had all five results down in south-west London were good. The most spectacular, obviously, was that one in Kingston and Surbiton. Mind you, Simon Hughes had a good result too, a thumping big majority of nearly 10,000. They didn't quite make Orpington, but uh, a good night for them, certainly. Davy Edward Jonathan, Liberal Democrat, 29,500. <laughs> A victorious night for Ed Davey as he's voted overwhelmingly as the Liberal Democrat MP. In 1997, Kingston and Surbiton had the smallest majority in London, just 56. Now it's seen a 24% increase in the vote. Because it's such a positive result for Liberal Democrats, not just here in Kingston and Surbiton, but across London, across the South East, across the country, um, we're obviously on a bit of a wave. In defeat, the Conservative candidate, David Shaw, left the council chamber swiftly. Within minutes, his entourage was nowhere to be seen. Lady Malkani, Newsroom South East. Now, overall, a miserable night for the Tories nationally, but they did have a little bit of success in Essex, didn't they? Well, that's right. On the, on the fringes of North London there, they picked up Romford, Upminster, and then further out in Essex, uh, Castle Point. The only three, I think, Tory gains in, in the whole of the country, really. So it's interesting that... Uh, the, the sort of Thatcherite part of North London, the C2s they, they talk about, the blue-collar support, coming back to the Tories, whereas it's not in the rest of the region. The Conservatives clawed back three seats they lost to Labour in 1997. Romford, a predicted win for the Conservatives, was returned to them with a comfortable majority of 6,000 for Andrew Rosendell. Well, I'm delighted. It's a wonderful honour to be elected the MP for Romford, and I'm very grateful to the people of Romford for choosing me. I shall work very hard and ensure that they have an MP in Romford that will speak up for local issues. Upminster, another key London target for the Tories, was narrowly recaptured by their candidate, Angela Watkinson. It was very close and I knew it was going to be, yes. So, uh, one of the major efforts today has been making sure that our supporters actually translated their votes in, in the polling booths. A small victory for the Tories in London as it witnesses the return of the Essex man. Rebecca Towers, Newsroom South East, Hornchurch. Now, John, as we've heard, there's been an incredibly low turnout across the country and in London an average of 56%. Why do you think people just weren't turning out to vote? Well, I think there's a difference to be, to be drawn here. There are seats like Vauxhall and some of the other inner city seats where the turnout is absolutely miserably low, down to about 45%. But if you look in seats where the result really was on a knife edge, like Kingston and Surbiton, much higher, up to sort of 68%. So obviously people think if, the, if their vote really counts, they went out to vote. I think a lot of people were just saying, oh, well, taking it for granted that Labour were going to win comfortably. And that's where, where there was the low turnout. Now, in the South East, just a total of four seats have changed. It wasn't very exciting, was it? 
Well, I don't know about that, you know. There were some pretty gripping contests. Uh, we were all a bit surprised about the size of Ed Davies' majority there in Kingston and Surbiton. I mean, he won it by 56 votes last time, and now he's back with 16,000, so a great personal triumph for him. Stephen Twigg, you know, was biting his nails until last night because he only had a very slender majority. He's done very well, and there were a lot of seats that could have gone either way. Now, in the end, Labour have hold on, held on to most of them, but there were some pretty close contests, and even though Labour has won most of the contests, I can tell you that there were some pretty jangling nerves last night. Talking of Stephen Twigg and of personal triumph, there was a very different night this time round for Mr Portillo. Are we looking at the, uh, the next leader of the Tory party in, in that Kensington and Chelsea MP? I think we might be, yes, because uh, he, um, he, he had a good result himself in his own constituency. I must admit, when I was listening to him making his, making his speech in Kensington and Chelsea, it sounded a bit like a leadership bid, even though, of course, he claimed he was praising William Hague's leadership. Thank you, John. Now, in addition to deciding who will be their MPs, many areas have also been voting in the local elections. Results on these polls will be declared throughout the morning and we'll have that information for you in our later programmes. Don't forget you can get all the latest analysis of the election results here in London and the South East in a special programme at 9 o'clock this morning. If you can't get to a television, there's also coverage on our local radio stations and on our website. Just before we go, we'll take a quick look at the weather. Early sunshine will give way to sunny intervals and some light showers. Top temperatures should peak at around 18 Celsius. I'll be back in around 20 minutes' time. Now, though, back to Jeremy and Sophie. Britain wakes up to an historic second term of Labour government, but what now for the Conservatives? It is indeed a, a night of history for our party, but the one thing that we have to remember is that now is the time that the people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promise that we will do, and they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast from BBC News with Jeremy Bowen and Sophie Raworth. The headlines this morning, it's another landslide for Labour. Tony Blair is back in Downing Street with an, un with an expected majority of 167, the biggest ever achieved by a governing party. William Haig described the result as deeply disappointing for the Tories. Charles Kennedy's Liberal Democrats get their highest number of seats since 1929. But turnout is the lowest since 1918. Let's go live now to pictures of William Hague arriving at Conservative Central Office. He's flown down this morning from his North Yorkshire constituency. A tough morning for him, no doubt, ahead. It's not sure whether he's going to say anything before he goes in. We understand that he will be going in to thank party workers who already, he said this morning, have worked so hard for so little reward. He has already said this morning that he is deeply disappointed with the result. Obviously, he's going to be looking very closely at his own future now. That, that is the main story this morning, really, is after the election result itself. It's what does William Hay do next? He worked very hard throughout the campaign, and he has got precisely nowhere. To get back into power next time round, the Tories will have to get exactly the same kind of swing they would have had to have got now. They had a big mountain to climb, and it's as big as ever. There he goes, going through the party workers, still smiling, William Hague. His smile hasn't slipped, has it? It hasn't slipped all night, and there he goes indoors. We are expecting him, though, to speak in about half an hour. We will, of course, bring you live coverage of that as soon as it happens. Well, Tony Blair has won an historic second term in office with another landslide majority. With some results still outstanding, the projected results show Labour being returned to power with a majority of 167, just 10 less than four years ago. Labour has won 413 seats, the Tories 164 so far, the same number as the last election, and the Liberal Democrats 47, an increase of seven. Labour's share of the vote is around 42%, the Conservatives 33% and the Liberal Democrats 19%. But the turnout was the worst since 1918. Only around 59% of people turned out to vote. This morning we'll be analysing the results, talking to leading figures in the main parties and bringing you election news from your area. But first, this report from Breakfast's political correspondent, Carol Walker. <laughs> Tony Blair received a hero's welcome from party workers and stars at Millbank Tower, Labour's headquarters. He's achieved the historic second term, which has been his burning ambition since he became Prime Minister and says he's won the battle of ideas. 
but the joy at victory is tempered by the warning signals of the low turnout and there is none of the euphoria of four years ago. Instead, he's stressing that Labour must now fulfil the expectations of the voters. Now is the time that the people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promised that we will do, and they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. Our mandate is to carry on the work that we started, to be sure that on the foundation of a strong economy, delivered by a brilliant Chancellor, that we end up investing... <laughs> ..that we invest in our schools, in our hospitals, in our transport, in the police, in our streets, By the time William Hague arrived at his count at Richmond in Yorkshire, he'd already conceded defeat and telephoned Tony Blair to congratulate him on Labour's victory. He admitted it was a deeply disappointing result for the Conservatives, but did not say whether he wanted to continue as leader. Clearly, we in our party must review, redouble and intensify our efforts to provide an alternative government for the country in the future. I will set out my views later this morning on how that process should begin. Despite all the speculation about the leadership, no potential challenger to Mr Haig has emerged yet, and the man so often tipped as his likely successor, Michael Portillo, has been resolutely loyal so far. I hope that nobody will say anything hasty in the coming hours and days that any of us might wish to regret thereafter. I pay tribute to the campaign which has been so skillfully led by William Haig. The Liberal Democrats have been celebrating their best ever night. They seized Chesterfield from Labour, a seat that was held for so long by Tony Benn who stood down at this election. Their leader, Charles Kennedy, said the night's results were a verdict not just on the government, but on the opposition too. It is also a doubly historic night for the Liberal Democrats in that we have, in all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. One of the biggest surprises was a personal landslide for retired Dr Richard Taylor, the independent candidate in Wire Forest, who'd fought a ferocious campaign against the downgrading of his local hospital. You, the way I view this is a tremendous reaction from the people against a very powerful government, against a very powerful political system that overrides the will of the people. Yeah. In Oldham, the contest was dominated by the recent race riots. Though the Environment Minister Michael Meacher held Oldham West and Woyton, Nick Griffin of the British National Party won a record 16% of the vote. Candidates were banned from making speeches for fear of inflaming local tension, but Mr Griffin later claimed the result represented a protest by white people against racist attacks. Which way are we going? At Brentwood and Ongar in Essex, the former BBC correspondent Martin Bell failed to unseat the Tory Eric Pickles. The man in the white suit, who famously defeated Neil Hamilton in Tatton at the last election, is out of Parliament. But Sean Woodward, who famously defected from the Conservatives and has been given a rough ride in St Helens, held the seat comfortably for Labour. In Hartlepool, Peter Mandelson also enjoyed a substantial majority. The close friend of the Prime Minister, twice forced to leave the Cabinet, spoke of the inner steel that had helped him through when opponents said he was facing political oblivion. They underestimated Hartlepool and they underestimated me because I am a fighter and not a quitter. Tony Blair and his wife Cherie are now back inside number 10 Downing Street. It's thought the Prime Minister will begin work right away to appoint a new cabinet and to bring about wider changes in the way the government is run. Carol Walker, BBC News.
while in Scotland, the Conservatives failed to make any significant comeback, but they did capture their first Westminster seat since 1997. But it was a bad night for the Scottish National Party. Its share of the vote dropped. The Liberal Democrats gained ground, but it was left to Labour to take most of the seats. The Scottish Conservatives had pinned their hopes on the former Foreign Secretary, Sir Malkin Rifkin, leading a revival by winning back his Edinburgh Pentland seat from Labour. It wasn't to be. I said four years ago that the Labour Party should consider they had a leasehold, not a freehold, of this constituency. And indeed, that is what it is, but the lease is lasting slightly longer uh, than I would have preferred. The Tories also fell to win targeted seats in Eyre One, and in Eastwood. Three, eight, but Galloway and Upper Nithsdale, the part of Scotland worst hit by foot and mouth disease, did give the Tories a taste of success. It came after a recount. Another recount in Perth saw the Scottish Nationalists beat the Conservatives by just 48 votes. The SNP have confirmed uh, as the second party of Scotland and that gives us a, a platform of which to advance to the Scottish parliamentary elections in two years' time. The Liberal Democrats had a successful night, holding on to their strongholds in the Highlands and the Borders. But it was Labour's night, keeping their tight grip on Scotland. Assad Ahmed, BBC News. Labour's success across the UK was reflected in Wales, where it's lost just one of the seats it won in 1997. The political map of Wales has changed little, with Labour taking 34 seats, Plaid Cymru 4 and the Liberal Democrats 2. Monmouth, the Conservatives' number one target in Wales, was held by Labour. The Tories again have no seats in Wales. Plaid Cymru supporters in the early hours of the morning celebrating with their hero Adam Price, who, as predicted, took the largely rural seat of Carmarthen Eastern to Never from Labour. But that victory at the end of a long night was as good as it got for the Welsh nationalists. Earlier they lost an Ismore in the Isle of Anglesey to Labour. A huge shock and a clear sign that the expected Plaid Cymru surge on the back of Welsh Assembly successes two years ago wasn't going to happen. The Rhondda, Caffili and Isloin, all Labour strongholds in the South Wales Valleys, where Plaid Cymru had put in so much effort, stayed under Labour control, albeit with reduced majorities. With the Liberal Democrats doing well to hang on to the two rural seats of Montgomery and Brecon and Radnorshire, the big losers again in Wales are the Conservatives. Humiliatingly, by failing to take Monmouth, Wales has again failed to return a single Tory MP to Westminster. And with 34 of the 40 Welsh MPs still from Labour, the political map of Wales this morning, like the rest of Britain, is very much red for Labour. Rudda Davis, BBC News, Cardiff. Meanwhile, two IUC officers and a woman were injured last night after a gunman fired on a polling station at Draperstown in County Londonderry. It's understood the police fired one shot, but the attacker managed to escape by car. One of the IUC officers was wounded in the shoulder. His colleague was hit in the arm and the woman was shot in the leg. It's believed a Republican dissident group was to blame for the attack. Well, Tony Blair is back in London after returning from his Sedgefield constituency early this morning. Our political correspondent, Philip Thomas, is outside number 10 Downing Street. They're going to be concerned about the turnout, aren't they? Uh, about one in four of possible voters voted Labour. I think they are concerned about that, you know, and overnight I heard Jack Straw trying to explain it, saying perhaps it's in a way the politics of contentment, uh, that the economy's doing well, that there's the feel-good factor, that maybe people didn't feel the need to come out and vote. And I suppose we can't really tell yet whether it's a sign of the times, whether it is something to do with that feel-good factor, or a sign of a wider disenchantment, people just not being engaged with politicians. And that, of course, must be what's worrying Mr Blair, because, of course, in these last two weeks especially, he's been saying it's not a party, it's a cause. And mine is a crusade to put schools and hospitals first. That sort of evangelical language does seem partly to have fallen upon deaf ears. And briefly, Philip, uh, big challenges lie ahead for the Labour Party. The question now is, can they deliver? That's right. On public services, of course, they've raised expectations. They have to live up to that now. And also the challenges of the euro, of the referendum that everyone expects will be the next big political debate in Britain. Thanks, Philip. They're in Downing Street.
Well, the question now is what happens to the Conservative Party and, of course, to its leader, William Haig? Well, at Conservative Central Office is our chief political correspondent, Nick Robinson. Nick William Haig arrived just back there a few moments ago. He did indeed, and we're expecting him out to talk to us any second after he's spoken to party workers. Four years ago, William Haig was here that morning. He thought he knew why the Tories had been defeated. 18 years in government, they'd been divided, the country had had enough. He thought he knew what was required to sort it out, bring the party together, modernise it, change the party's rules. And yet this morning, he finds his party nowhere, nowhere different from where they were four years ago, no progress at all. And therefore, in minutes, we'll see William Haig walk out just behind me from that door to explain what he thinks to the waiting newsmen there is the answer to the Tories' problems. Will he resign? Perhaps he will announce that he will go, but he won't go straight away. Certainly he'll point out the party has to revise all his ideas. Let's follow now Mr Haig's night with Summit Bowes. He feared it was going to be a bad night and he was proved right. By 3.15 in the morning, William Haig conceded defeat on the phone. By dawn, at his count in Richmond, he kept his resolve as personal victory in increasing his majority was tainted by the dismal failure of his troops. There is no doubt that the results tonight across the country are deeply disappointing for my party. And I feel for the candidates and the activists and supporters in other constituencies who have worked so hard for so little reward uh, this evening. The Labour Party will continue to form the government and I congratulate them on their victory and have already spoken to Mr Blair to congratulate him in person. The Tories' dire night started early on. The glum look on the faces of the faithful said it all as seat after seat declared for Labour. It wasn't until one in the morning that they had their first victory. A swing of 11% would have taken William Haig to Downing Street, but even loyal foot soldiers realised they were never anywhere near it. In the end, just under 2% was all they could muster. Conservative Party candidate, 18,931. But there was some cheer for William Haig. The return in droves of Essex man and woman to the Tory fold. Castlepoint, Upminster and Romford were all taken back from Labour. And the Tories will certainly have a character amongst their ranks. Ex-journalist and now a member for Henley, Boris Johnson, whose exuberance wasn't dented by the trouncing. We will, we, we will be back. We will return. We will come back and we are capable of regenerating ourselves. But not all Tories were so positive. But clearly any result under 200 seats for the Tories, a gain of 35 seats or so, would be very, very, very disappointing for us. William Haig intends to speak about the future direction of his party later this morning. Another parliament in opposition is certain, but leadership may not be. Sumit Bowes, BBC News. Nick, how much support has William Haig been given overnight in the past few hours from his shadow cabinet? Well, overnight they've all said the same thing. Don't act hastily. Why? Because four years ago, John Major left the party, went to watch the cricket, you may recall, and said, you get on with it, you find another leader. Haig believes that was a terrible error, that the party needed time to think. His shadow cabinet colleagues are urging him to give the party time to think. I genuinely don't know, Sophie, what's going to happen. My instinct is this. Haig knows he's got to go. He can't have any credibility after a result like this. But he may do what the party wants. Give them time, weeks, months maybe, to have the debate they've never really had about what on earth the Conservative Party is for. What I do know is, as he's speaking in there, there are tears flowing. Well, we can see preparations being made right behind you for William Haig to come out and talk to us. We'll be coming back to you as soon as that happens. Nick, thank you. It was the Liberal Democrats who made the most overall gains at their headquarters. This is our correspondent, Peter Hunt. Peter, their best night since 1929, an awfully long time ago. Yeah, I think they're very pleased here. They say they had a simple strategy. They had a message that had resonance, which is you can't get something for nothing. They hammered at that as Charles Kennedy travelled all over the country, a frenetic pace, 15,000 miles, 73 flights, and that was the message he put across. People want increased public services, and people will have to pay for it by modest tax increases. And that's the message they put across, and they've made gains. They got one seat off Labour, they lost one themselves, and they gained several from the Tories. But in, as well as gaining seats, also critically in terms of the long-term strategy of Charles Kennedy, 
they've increased the share of the vote and he thinks that's critical in order to keep on putting on the pressure and pushing the cause for change in the voting system here. OK, Peter there at the Liberal Democrat headquarters. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's have a look at the headlines in the papers this morning, starting with the Times the headline there. Blair storms back to number 10 and a picture there of um, his father, Leo Blair Sr., embracing his son after the declaration there at Sedgefield. And um, a very um, good, hard-hitting cover there, front page from the mirror. What the hell are you lot looking so smug about? There they are. Four Labour big cheeses. Get back to work. The Guardian election results special, they say Blair cruises to victory in a historic second term for Labour as Tories fight rearguard action. Big, big front page in The Independent as well. Labour landslide right across the top in red. Blair claims his mandate with a massive majority. The Sun this morning, it's my son what won it, is their headline. And again, another photograph there of Tony Blair and his father. Second historic landslide for Tony Blair. And uh, the FT, Labour wins historic landslide, second term, but low turnout takes the gloss of Blair's victory. And a picture there of uh, the Prime Minister with his wife and with his dad. Let's have a look at a couple of emails as well, because we've been getting loads on you this morning, loads from you this morning, mostly about the reasons why people didn't turn out. Something like two in five people didn't turn out to vote. Paul um, Edwards in Stafford says, I am dismayed at the turnout for this election. I believe that it is now time to make the vote compulsory like other countries. Kim Peters is a 17-year-old politics student. It angers me, Kim says, the amount of people who, that do not vote. 59% is an awful result. How can it be democratic when 41% of the country will be unrepresented in the new parliament? Keep your emails coming. Breakfast TV at bbc.co.uk, the address as usual. Now, throughout this election, we've heard comment and opinion from a group of undecided voters, especially selected for BBC Breakfast. They've told us how they voted and why. We vote voted for the Liberal Democrats. Because we thought they were the most honest and consistent throughout the campaign and the country needs to change. My husband and I decided to vote Conservative because we feel that the Conservative Party will offer the best for our family in the future. We both voted Labour and I voted because the unemployment figures have dropped greatly. And I voted Labour again for at long last we've got rid of this greed and selfishness that was created by the previous government and another four years for Labour will do a world of good. I voted for the Liberal Democrats because they've done a lot of good in my area so far and I believe that they'll honour the promises they've made over the election and uh, the straightest talking party I've seen. Well, joining us now from Westminster is Ian Taylor from the Conservatives. Good morning. Good morning. A devastating night. What went wrong? Well, uh, pretty well everything, obviously, because we've uh, not uh, got very many new people elected. I'm afraid we have to rethink our strategy. But the one that we adopted in the election campaign was wrong. And it, it uh, started off badly and got worse. And it started off badly largely because the public wanted to hear what our views were on how we could reform the public services and compare them with Labour's. And instead of which, we let off with tax cuts, which meant that for the whole of the campaign, the British public switched off from what anything William Hague was saying. However courageously and combatively and gutsily he put it across in the campaign as he went from place to place. Can you rethink your strategy with William Hague then as leader? Well I, I think William has uh, both the duty and experience now to, to help us lead into that debate. I mean how long it, it takes uh, for that to happen I do not know but it's quite clear that we cannot stay where we are in the spectrum of British politics because there we will perish. And if we're to rescue the party, this great party which I'm so proud of and have been member since the 1960s, I hate to see the state that we're in today. And we've got to start trying to address what the people want to hear. What are the social implications of economic policies? Not but just tax cuts. If William Hague said he wanted to stay on, would you back him? I think William would obviously uh, get a lot of sympathy at the moment uh, and indeed if he was prepared to readdress the strategy so that we became much more of an inclusive, socially aware party, much more positive about Europe, then I think William could stay on. But that's a decision I'd rather let him make at the moment because it's been a very difficult night for him and for the rest of us. What voters have quite clearly shown is that this wasn't a referendum on the Euro. 
Oh, of course it wasn't a referendum on the euro. That was a daft idea. Uh, only fanatics vote for a single issue in a general election, and the Tory party does not appeal just to fanatics. What do you do now, then? Uh, we think very carefully uh, and we also just look at what the Labour government's going to do. The Labour government's been elected on one great premise which is it's going to reform public services. If it genuinely is going to reform public services then there will be occasions when we should be helping it and we need to put forward positive ideas about how Conservatives would reform and extend and reinvigorate universal public services. But given if we can do that, then we are part of the relevant debate for the rest of the British public. But given that the Conservative campaign set out very clearly this was our last chance to save the pound, where do you go from here? Can you have another last chance to save the pound? I think there will be a lot of uh, my fellow Conservatives who are less positive about the Euro and indeed Europe than me, who will bitterly regret that foolish strategy. Ian Taylor, thank you very much. Now, very shortly, William Haig, the Conservative leader, will be emerging from Conservative Central Office. There you see it live, the uh, Assemble Press Corps. Uh, broadcasters are waiting. He's going to be talking, making his first statement since his uh, acceptance speech after he won his, uh, his own seat back in Richmond. He'll be talking, and we're wondering if he's going to be talking about his own political future. Plenty of speculation, of course, this morning about what's going to be happening. Yes, stay with us for that because we're expecting him to come out in about 10 minutes' time. Right now, though, out there is Sarah Wilmshurst with a look at the weather. Yes, here I am in central London and what a glorious start to the day weather-wise. Lots of sunshine around and with lighter winds it feels much warmer than it did this time yesterday. Now it's not just here in London that it's sunny. We've got plenty of clear weather around across many parts of the United Kingdom. But a lovely shot over Glasgow to show you clear blue skies here and a very light wind. Now looking at the satellite picture, we can see plenty of clear sky, not just across uh, England and Wales and uh, southern Scotland, but also into other western areas. But there is some cloud about too, particularly across the north and just a few showers here and there. Now through today, really we are looking at another day of sunshine and showers, so it's probably worth taking your umbrella out with you today, particularly across northern areas. Perhaps the best chance of staying dry across some um, central and southern parts of England and uh, south Wales. The showers here will be very few and far between. But as I say, they will be heavier across northern areas and they will become quite persistent too across western Scotland and Northern Ireland later on. Now those temperatures are still a bit disappointing for the beginning of June, 11 to 14 for Scotland, for Northern Ireland, around 16, perhaps 17 across England and Wales. But with lighter winds and the sunshine, it shouldn't feel too bad. So through tonight, some rain is going to head down from the northwest. That wet weather is still around tomorrow, and that will continue its progress towards the southeast through the day, although it probably won't reach southeast England until late on. In turn, that will clear away to a mixture of sunshine and showers for northern areas. Then on Sunday, sunny spells and scattered showers again, really, although most of the showers will be in the east, where there'll be some sharp ones. It'll be somewhat drier, the sh showers more scattered over towards the west. And taking a look at the outlook, well, after a rather unsettled weekend, as I was just showing you, showers or longer spells of rain, it does look like those showers will become fewer and further between next week. As the wind sees down, it will start to feel a little bit warmer. That's it. Sophie Jeremy, back to you two. Hey, Sarah, thanks very much. Little election snapshot for you now. The election of the Earl of Thurso as the Lib Dem MP for Caithness means the House of Commons has, for the first time, an hereditary peer amongst its membership. Stay with us. Not right now. We're going to join the news teams, though, across the UK. Good morning from Newsroom South East. I'm Nina Hossein. Well, overall, it was one of the lowest turnouts London and the South East has ever seen. The average in the capital was just 56%, some constituencies well below 50%. Last night, London and the South East looked like this, and now, well, as you can see, it's pretty difficult to spot the difference. Both the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives made gains, but the night belonged to Labour. Labour held on to nearly all the gains it made in the last election, including marginal seats like Finchley and Golders Green, Mrs Thatcher's old seat. And a 7.6% swing to Labour in Enfield Southgate meant Stephen Twigg held on to the seat he took from Michael Portillo in 1997. The Lib Dems maintain their swathe of south-west London, a total of five seats in the capital. In Kingston and Surbiton, they managed to turn a 56-vote win into a majority of more than 16,000. And in Guildford, the Lib Dems partied through the night after snatching the seat from the Tories. Lainey Marconi reports on how Charles Kennedy's party shored up its place in London's political scene. Davy Edward Jonathan, Liberal Democrat, 29,000...
A victorious night for Ed Davey as he's voted overwhelmingly as the Liberal Democrat MP. In 1997, Kingston and Surbiton had the smallest majority in London, just 56. Now it's seen a 24% increase in the vote. Because it's such a positive result for Liberal Democrats, not just here in Kingston and Surbiton, but across London, across the South East, across the country, um, we're obviously on a bit of a wave. In defeat, the Conservative candidate, David Shaw, left the council chamber swiftly. Within minutes, his entourage was nowhere to be seen. Lady Malkani, Newsroom South East. Indeed, it seemed the Liberal gains were often the Tories' loss. They simply didn't recapture the number of seats they were hoping for. But they managed to keep Labour's hands off Uxbridge and Chipping Barnet. Outside the capital, Martin Bell, the man in the white suit, was kept out of Parliament by the Brentwood and Ongar MP, Eric Pickles. But there were some games. The Conservatives did well in Essex, taking Romford and Upminster in the London borough of Havering and winning Castle Point from Labour. In addition to deciding who will be their MPs, many areas have also been voting in local elections. Results on these polls will be declared throughout the morning and we'll have that information for you in our later programmes. Don't forget you can get all the latest analysis of the election results here in London and the South East in a special programme at 9 o'clock this morning. And if you can't get to a television, there's also coverage on London Live 94.9 on our website or on CFAX page 170. Just before we go, we'll take a quick look at the weather. Early sunshine will give way to sunny intervals and some light showers. Temperatures should peak at highs of 18 Celsius. I'll be back in around 20 minutes' time. Now, though, back to breakfast and Jeremy and Sophie. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News at 7.29. We're expecting William Hague to make a statement outside Conservative Central Office in the next few minutes. This is a scene in Smith Square now. We will be going live to William Hague as soon as he steps out of that door. But until then, we're going to Moira for a summary of this morning's main news. Good morning. Tony Blair has won an historic second term in office with another landslide majority. With some results still outstanding, the projected results show Labour being returned to power with a majority of 167, just 10 less than four years ago. Labour has won 413 seats and the Tories 164, so far the same number as in the previous election. The Liberal Democrats won 46, an increase of seven. Labour's share of the vote is about 43%, the Conservatives 33% and the Liberal Democrats 19 But the turnout was the worst since 1918 with only about 59% of people voting. The Prime Minister this morning joined party workers and stars for the celebrations at Millbank Tower, Labour's headquarters in London. The joy at a second historic victory has been tempered by the low turnout there's none of the euphoria of four years ago, instead a determination to fulfil the expectations of voters. The people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promised that we will do, and they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. By the time William Hague arrived to hear the result in his Richmond constituency, he'd already conceded defeat and telephoned Tony Blair to congratulate him on Labour's victory. He admitted the results were deeply disappointing for the Conservatives, but did not say whether he wanted to continue as leader. Clearly, we in our party must review, redouble and intensify our efforts to provide an alternative government for the country in the future. I will set out my views later this morning on how that process should begin. The Liberal Democrats have been celebrating their best ever night seizing Chesterfield from Labour, holding seats like Newbury that had looked vulnerable. Their leader, Charles Kennedy, said it was a verdict not just on the government, but on the opposition too. It is also a doubly historic night for the Liberal Democrats in that we have, in all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. Begin. Tony Blair and his wife Cherie are now back inside number 10 Downing Street. It's thought the Prime Minister will begin work right away to appoint a new cabinet and to bring about wider changes in the way the government is run. Carol Walker, BBC News.
And in other news this morning, eight Japanese children have been stabbed to death by a man wielding a knife who burst into their primary school. At least 20 other children, all aged between six and eight, were stabbed together with three teachers. The attacker is said to have made his way from classroom to classroom, slashing out indiscriminately with a kitchen knife. A 37-year-old man with a history of mental illness has been arrested by police. Here, James Lawson, the father who killed his mentally ill daughter, is due to be sentenced today at Maidstone Crown Court. He pleaded guilty in May to manslaughter with diminished responsibility after helping his suicidal daughter, Sarah, to end her life. Mr. Lawson and his wife claimed their 22-year-old daughter was failed repeatedly by the National Health Service. In the United States, the Federal Appeals Court has rejected Timothy McVeigh's request to delay his execution for the Oklahoma City bombing. He is due to die by a lethal injection on Monday, six years after 168 people were killed in America's worst act of terrorism. Timothy McVeigh's lawyer has said he will not ask the U.S. Supreme Court to delay the execution. The result of the Irish Republic's referendum on the European Union's Treaty of Nice will be known today. Irish voters have been asked whether they accept the treaty, which permits the enlargement of the European community. If they reject the treaty, it will be a serious obstacle to plans to allow more countries to join. Britain has seen one of the biggest falls worldwide in deaths from testicular cancer over the last two decades. Research published in The Lancet says early diagnosis and improved treatment are behind the 72% reduction since 1979. The figures were better than those of any other country apart from Sweden. A pitch invasion disrupted play in last night's England versus Pakistan cricket match at Edgbaston. The players were forced to leave the field for half an hour as thousands of Pakistan supporters swarmed onto the pitch, mistakenly believing the game had been won. It was the first incident of its kind at an international cricket match in Britain. That's the news for now. Back to Jeremy and Sophie. Laura, thanks very much. Breakfast TV at bbc.co.uk if you want to speak to us, as always, by email. And, and lots plenty of people of you do are this morning. Are trying, yep. <laughs> We've had loads of emails already, lots about the uh, low turnout. One here from Ron Green who says, I was irritated by some of the comments from emailers about non-voters. I did not vote. It was my protest. How else can I protest? And Lynn says from St Albans, the poor turnout last night reflects the fact that people do not believe their voices are heard. Now into big letters. This country cries out for electoral reform. Proportional representation. Lib Dem supporter there, I reckon. One here from Mike Day in Kent, who says, could the media itself be partly to blame for the voters' apathy? Ever since the election was announced, an inordinate amount of TV and press coverage has been given over, it, over to it. Of course, it's a very important issue, but many will feel that they have been saturated by politics. Stefan Osofsky, all this talk of democracy being set aside by a poor turnout is untrue. We have a right to vote. It is up to every person so entitled to exercise that right if he or she desires. A decision not to vote is his or her democratic choice. And the last one here, we'll get through as many as we can, we promise this morning. One here from Sally, I'm one, Sally uh, Satkaranath. I'm one of many people who did not vote. The idea of making voting compulsory, I find undemocratic, she says. Well, our panel of video voters have told us how they voted and why. <laughs> We both voted Labour because... We wanted to see continued expenditure in the public services and Labour offered the best options. I voted Labour because I believe that Labour is moving in the right direction. And given time, I think things will improve for most people across the country. I voted Labour because I think they're doing a fine job and I want to give them four more years to prove it. I voted Liberal Democrat because they've got the best local constituent and I like the way they campaigned for the last two weeks. We voted the SNP. And we voted the SNP for Alex Salmon because he has a passion for his politics. Well, let's go now back to uh, Smith Square to Conservative Central Office. Our correspondent, Nick Robinson, is there. And William Hague, Nick, is expected to come out any moment now. Yes, we expect him any minute. I know that he's uh, been addressing central office troops inside, thanking them for the work he's done. I understand he did not tell all of the staff there what announcement he is about to make 
to the country and to the party. He merely thanked them for their work and then went into a series of smaller meetings with his key advisers. I mean, the truth is, Sophie, he has made as leader no progress at all in four years. He promised a fresh start for his party. He believed that if he removed the party's divisions on Europe by having a settled policy on the single currency, that would help. He believed if he changed the party's constitution, that would help too. He believed if he put forward, as he saw it, a more modern approach, that would help. None of it has, and therefore his future is, of course, in the balance. But for those who assume this morning that he will come out and merely resign, remember one thing. William Hague himself and many of his colleagues were highly critical of John Major for walking away, as they saw it, after the awful defeat of four years ago. They felt it left the party rudderless at a crucial time and he should have stayed on at least for a matter of months to help the party settle down, to talk, to discuss about what it did next. I simply don't know what he's about to announce. No one I've spoken knows, but it seems to me at least possible that he'll signal that he's ready to stand down, promise to keep up the work as opposition leader, saying it's important in Parliament to do that job, but say that of course he recognises the party needs to think again, not only about its policies, but also about the man at the top. Yes. That is one possibility. There are others too. Nick, obviously, it, they made it very clear during throughout their campaign, they said this is the last chance to save the pound. Voters clearly did not think that. They certainly didn't think that, and indeed other people involved in the coalition who want to save the pound didn't think that. It was devastating, really, for William Hague that Business for Sterling, which is the organisation, one of the organisations, which hopes that it will persuade Britain to vote no in any referendum on the single currency, put out press advertisements on the day of the advert, uh, the day of the election, saying, forget it, this is not a referendum on the euro. Even though we disagree with Tony Blair on the euro, this election has got nothing to do with it. One of the reasons it would be terribly difficult for William Hague to fight on and say, look, I'll lead the campaign to save the pound, is that those other people in other parties, uh, in other interest groups who want to fight to save the pound have effectively dumped him. They've said he is a liability for the campaign to save the pound. That's one reason he may have to go. The lack of progress for the Tory party, of course, is another. But this is not a party who's desperate to find a new leader. They're shell-shocked this morning. Morning, Sophie. They don't really know why they've lost. Certainly none of them believe they were going to win this election, but there were people critical of Hague as well as friendly to Hague who insisted again and again when I spoke to them, it's better on the streets than it says in the polls. It really is. We're going to win seats. Some calculated as many as 50 seats. They thought particularly in areas like Essex where they did make one or two gains, but in Kent where they made none, that for example their campaigning on asylum seekers or the euro would be rewarded with many, many more seats, but it didn't happen and they weren't rewarded, and, and therefore they've got to think again. Nick, as far as, as a, a potential uh, successor to William Hague, I mean, there do not seem to be many people putting their heads above the parapet, do they? No, but that's partly because they're waiting to hear from him. They are waiting for another reason too. Most of the people who want to replace William Hague believe what the party needs is not a personality battle lasting a number of weeks in which people's images are discussed, but a complete rethink about what their policies ought to be. Like the one that was led by Sir Keith Joseph and Margaret Thatcher, her acolytes, when Ted Heath lost an election in 1974. Then there was a great public debate about what it meant to be a Conservative. Keith Joseph told his party at times he'd been ashamed to be a Tory. He'd been wrong. They argued about the role of the state. They argued about what they ought to do if they formed another government. They had a public argument. They chose Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism was born. The critics on the right of the party who are most likely to take over, the Mauds, the Portillos, the Duncan Smiths and others, that's what they believe is needed, not a short leadership campaign in which it's simply a change of face. And Nick, as far as this campaign has gone and this disastrous result for the Conservatives, is there a feeling that the Conservatives have been rejected because of the leader or because of a much deeper rooted problem within the party? Oh, much deeper than that. They do believe there's what they call a Hague factor. No one denies it. You go on the doorstep, people are unimpressed. They don't warm to William Hague for some reason. They don't like him, some respect him. 
but most Tories, those who like him, those who hate him, those who agree with him, those who disagree, they all say it's much more than simply William Hague. There is some problem that the Tory party has addressing the public, and it isn't simply that they were in office for 18 years. Is it, as some suggest, that they're not modern enough, they don't look comfortable with Britain as it is, multiracial, uh, having women working as well as being mothers, perhaps being more tolerant uh, and welcoming about people of different sexuality as well. That is one view. What, another view is that they have got it wrong on Europe, that although the country is anxious about Europe, it needs to know that there is a future that doesn't mean cutting itself off from the principal market. That is another debate that takes place. Finally, though, and I think perhaps the most critical, is the sense that the party has to have something to say about education and health and transport, the great public services, that merely to go into this election was not enough. Okay, Here's William Nick, there Let's, he is. Uh, hear what he's got to say. Good morning. Well, the people have spoken. And just as it is vital to encourage everyone to participate in our democracy, so it is important to understand and respect the result. It is important to be clear about the lessons for the Conservative Party. Some may be for debate in the future, Others are already clear. Let the Labour Party have won the election, and I've already congratulated them on doing so. But they've done so without great public enthusiasm. The voters have given them the benefit of the doubt. But the government should understand that a second successive failure to deliver would breed deep disillusionment and cynicism, not only about the government, but with politics in general. It is therefore a vital task of the Conservative Party in the coming Parliament to hold the government to account for the promises it has made and the trust people have placed in it. The government has been elected to do a job, so have we as the opposition, and we must do it. Second, the Conservative Party during the last Parliament, but not in this election, made significant advances, vastly extending its local government base. We will start from a stronger base in this parliament than in the last. The forces of conservatism are stronger and at least better organized than they were four years ago. Third, despite that stronger base and the diminishing enthusiasm for new labor, we have not been able to persuade a majority or anything approaching a majority in the country that we are yet the alternative government that they need. Nor have I been able to persuade sufficient numbers that I am their alternative Prime Minister. I believe that the next general election will be a far closer contest than the one just held. It is the overriding duty of our party to be not only effective in Parliament and rigorous in campaigning, but to present a leadership with the strongest possible credibility and appeal. In achieving that objective, no man or woman is indispensable and no individual is more important than the party and thereby the democratic health of our country. I've led this party for four years, have always considered it a great privilege and have actually enjoyed every single day. I believe strongly, passionately in everything that I've fought for. But it's also vital for leaders to listen and parties to change. I believe it's vital that the party be given the chance to choose a leader who can build on my work, but also take new initiatives and hopefully command a larger personal following in the country. And I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party when a successor can be elected in the coming months. I will continue until that time to carry out the parliamentary and other duties of the leader of the opposition. Some colleagues have urged me to stay on for a period so that the party can reflect at greater length. But it will in any case take some weeks for a successor to be elected under our new leadership election rules. And the process cannot start until a new chairman of the 1922 committee has been chosen. A longer period would leave the party with a caretaker leadership for too long. And I believe a new leader must be elected in time to prepare for the party conference in October. I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks for the untiring efforts of my colleagues across the party 
who made it possible to fight a coherent, vigorous and united, albeit unsuccessful, campaign. I'd like to express similar thanks to my staff who have formed such a, an intensely loyal and professional team and to Fionn, without whom I would not have had the strength to carry the last four years. And above all, to the many millions who voted Conservative yesterday, I wish I could have led you to victory. But now we must all work for our victories of the future. Thank you very much indeed. A very gracious speech there from Thank William you. Hague announcing that he is Thanks to step down in the coming months. So he is leaving the crowd with his wife, Fionn. Uh, and we are joined now by John Prescott, I think. John Prescott is going to be with us here. He's going to respond, I hope, to what, uh, to what Mr. Haig has just been saying. Mr. Prescott, do you have some personal compassion for Mr. Haig at this moment, for him, of a, a terrible moment for him, of course? Well, it's quite a traumatic moment, and I think, uh, as the leader of the Conservative Party, he has suffered a tremendous defeat, and he's made that decision, and it's not for us to intrude on what is the private grief in the Tory party. We got a very emphatic mandate as the Labour government to get on with the job we started, and that's what we'll do from today onwards. Does it bring, bring you uh, back to those days of the 1980s when Labour had many election defeats? Yes, there are similar rings about it. Indeed, uh, parties have to go through these traumatic moments, I think, if they want to go through the process of change. It certainly happened in the Labour Party. But, you know, Mr Haig has made an honest decision as he sees the issue, and it's fair enough, and his party now must decide how they deal with the re-election of a new leader. But at the end of the day, our job is, after a tremendous victory that we've uh, achieved, is to get on with the job, as the Prime Minister said, and that's what we'll be doing from today onwards. Yes, let's talk about the next five years. Now, Mr Blair knows what he has to do. We know what he has to do. The question is, can he do it? When he tries to pull those levers of power, are they going to respond? Well, yes, I think uh, Mr Haig was quite wrong to say we haven't delivered. I mean, that was part of their propaganda in this election, which clearly the electorate rejected. You know the card I used to go around with about the hospitals, the health, the economy, etc. Uh, we did deliver on that, quite in fact. delivered so. on everything, though. You say you, well, you what, said during what, the election you needed a second chance. Yes, but, I mean, what do you mean we didn't deliver? On all those five we had on that card, we delivered. And uh, we What I mean is there are plenty of things left on your agenda from your first term which you really have to get to grips with now. Yes, that is the message you've had from the electorate, I, I know, but please, please, you guys, if you want politics to have a, a real role to play, you must allow us to answer. I've made the point that on the cards and the pledges, we delivered on them. We've now produced another card, which they weren't prepared to do, about the increase in police, nurses, doctors, teachers, and uh, the, uh, the public clearly wanted that, and that's what we have to deliver on. We go around and we promise something, and in this government, the first period of a Labour government now, now entering into a historic second term, we delivered, and that's why we got the vote. It was quite an emphatic vote. Now, come the next election, people, though, are not going to be saying, look, the, the pledges on the card have been ticked off. What they're going to be looking at is just how they feel about the way life is in this country, especially in terms of the public services. At the moment, people feel pretty bad about it. Well, I don't accept what you're saying about that. And you cannot say that after this result we've just had. You guys keep, you know, nibbling away at the margins about this. What a lot of people actually supported Labour is because they were strong in the economy and able to put money into the public services. Now, a lot done, but a lot more to do. And what they've said to us, we like what is happening now, economic prosperity and social justice, not been achieved by governments before, quite frankly, in such a scale. And they now want us to complete that job, as pointed out by Tony Blair. And we will do that. And come the next election, will be judged on that, and I do believe we'll deliver. When are you going to have a referendum on the euro? 18 months, the Liberal Democrats well, say the, they want. Well, the Liberal Democrats, or whatever they might want, they're not the government, quite frankly. So and tell us what you want. Being it. What we've said is that we'll judge it on the economic conditions. We were the ones that actually said there will be a referendum on this if we so decide that these conditions have been satisfied. Parliament will speak, Cabinet first, Parliament, and then the people will have that referendum on it. And I think that was the answer to Mr Haig when he went round saving, said he was saving the pound and had to ditch it at the last week of the election. OK, John Prescott, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Well, dramatic scenes there outside Conservative Central Office. Mr Haig has now left. Nick, where does this leave the party?
Well, it leaves the party with a great yawning vacuum. I mean, William Hague is someone, let's just remember personally, who was interested in politics from his teens, spoke at the age of 16. He becomes one of the first, there's been one other, Austin Chamberlain, Tory leaders, never to become Prime Minister. He's given up now. The party has to elect the chairman of its backbench committee, it's called the 1922, and, and then starts a party leadership contest, which could take some weeks yet. But who wants the job? Exactly. Who are, who are the main contenders? Michael Portillo must be one of them. Well, must be one of them if he wants the job. And we're going to have to add that sentence to every single name we come up with, Sophie. All the conversations we've had about who might do this job were people who expected their party to make some progress and thought, OK, it's going to be tough, but I'll have a fair shot at becoming prime minister at the next election. You simply cannot argue that now. No party, as we know in advance of the election we've just had, no party has ever overturned a majority of this size. They are precisely where they were four years ago, and yet they've had four wasted years, some may say years going backwards. So who wants the job? Let's just go through those runners. Yes, of course, Michael Portillo, but he, I know, is personally very nervous of the personal toll that will be taken, the references back to his homosexual past, the attacks that have been on him already in the Sun newspaper, sometimes in the Telegraph and the Mail as well. Then there'll be others. Will there be Anne Widdicombe? Will there be Ian Duncan Smith and Francis Maud? Remember this though, it's different from four years ago. The MPs get to choose two and then that goes to every single member of the Conservative Party. It's going to be dramatic. It certainly has been already, Nick. Thank you. We're back at eight with the latest national picture. For now though, we join the BBC's news teams across the UK. Good morning from Newsroom South East, I'm Nina Hossein. Well, overall, it was one of the lowest turnouts London and the South East has ever seen. The average in the capital was just 56%, some constituencies well below 50%. Last night, London and the South East looked like this, and now, well, as you can see, it's pretty difficult to spot the difference. Both the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives made gains, but the night belonged to Labour. The Lib Dems maintain their swathe of south-west London, a total of six seats in the capital. In Kingston and Surbiton they managed to turn a 56-vote win into a majority of more than 16,000. And in Guildford, the Lib Dems parted through the night after snatching the seat from the Tories. Labour held on to nearly all the gains it made in the last election, including marginal seats like Finchley and Golders Green, Mrs Thatcher's old seat. And a 5% swing to Labour in Enfield Southgate meant Stephen Twigg held on to the seat he took from Michael Portillo in 1997. In fact, the loss of Guildford to the Liberals was one of the worst blows on a bad night for the Tories. They simply didn't gain the seats they were hoping for. But they managed to keep Labour hands off Uxbridge and Chipping Barnet. And outside the capital, Martin Bell, the man in the white suit, was kept out of Parliament by the Brentwood and Ongar MP Eric Pickles. But there were some gains, and it seems Essex man is gradually coming back to the fold, taking Romford and Upminster in the London borough of Havering and winning Castle Point from Labour. So overall, it was a pretty good night for Labour. They managed to hold on to their seats in Wandsworth. Sally Graham reports. We may have lost the battle tonight, but we're going to win the war. May the forces of conservatism be with you. In fact, the forces of conservatism were absent in both marginal seats of Battersea and Putney, where Labour's Martin Linton and Tony Coleman were returned on majority similar to 97s. Having a, a swing of over 2% to Labour in this seat augurs well for the other Labour marginals in London and obviously winning seats from the Tories in London. I think people see it to be too right. And I don't think there's an interest in Europe as people thought there was. The, the, that didn't hit us on the doorsteps at all. The newly re-elected MPs were soon joined in their celebrations by Tooting's Tom Cox. Their main disappointment, the low turnout of an average of 55%. Sally Graham, News from South East, Wandsworth. In Kent, it was very much a case of as you were. Not one of the 17 seats changed hands with Labour holding eight seats and the Conservatives nine. It was Labour who had most to cheer about in Kent. It was supposed to be the night the Tories fought back, but in many cases, Labour MPs actually increased their majorities. Chatham, Gillingham and Medway 
all used to be safe Tory seats, but not anymore. While in Dover, Labour's victorious Gwyn Prosser accused the Conservatives of playing the race card. To use the sort of language they use and to, and to heat up the atmosphere in places like Dover, which have got real problems to solve, I think that's unforgivable. It could have been worse for the Tories. They held the nine seats they started the evening with, including Maidstone. Like elsewhere, turnouts were down across the county, with apathy proving the politician's biggest opponent. Paul Seagard in Kent for Newsroom South East. And overall, a miserable night for the Tories, though they had a ray of hope in Essex. They made inroads in the county. The Conservatives clawed back three seats they lost to Labour in 1997. Romford, a predicted win for the Conservatives, was returned to them with a comfortable majority of 6,000 for Andrew Rosendell. Well, I'm delighted. It's a wonderful honour to be elected the MP for Romford, and I'm very grateful to the people of Romford for choosing me. I shall work very hard and ensure that they have an MP in Romford that will speak up for local issues. Upminster, another key London target for the Tories, was narrowly recaptured by their candidate, Angela Watkinson. It was very close and I knew it was going to be, yes. So, uh, one of the major efforts today has been making sure that our supporters actually translated their votes in, in the polling booths. A small victory for the Tories in London as it witnesses the return of the Essex man. The man in the white suit, Martin Bell, failed to unseat Tory MP Eric Pickles in Brentwood and Ongar in Essex. Bell, Martin, 13,737. The former reporter stood as an independent after local Tory fears of an evangelical church was influencing the constituency party. Pickles' 9,000 plus majority was slashed to less than 3,000. Rebecca Towers, News from South East. Well, joining us now is our political editor, John Craig. John, has it been a very successful night for Labour in the South East? Certainly a good night for Labour, a good night's work, really, an even better night, really, for the Liberal Democrats, bad night for the Tories. And we're hearing that William Hague is saying that he is going to step down. But uh, here to talk about the Tories' performance in London and the South East as a whole is Michael Brown, former Conservative MP, now columnist on The Independent. Michael, why do you think the Tories have failed to make the gains that they hoped to make in London and the South East? I think, John, uh, the economy is stupid. London and the South East is booming at the moment. Uh, the British economy under Labour has obviously, in the view of the voters, done extremely well. Uh, the Tories simply are not the party for the metropolitan type of people that live in the South East and live in London. Uh, they just simply didn't connect with the uh, London uh, Islington sector. William Hague has resigned as leader of the Conservative Party in the wake of his party's crushing defeat in the general election. And I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party when a successor can be elected in the coming months. I will continue until that time to carry out the parliamentary and other duties of the Leader of the Opposition. Good morning. Welcome to the programme with Sophie Raworth and Jeremy Bowen. Friday, June the 8th. These are the headlines this morning. The Conservative Party is looking for a new leader after another landslide for Labour. Mr Haig said he regretted he had been unable to persuade the British people to support his policies. Tony Blair's projected majority of 167 is the biggest ever achieved by a governing party. Charles Kennedy's Liberal Democrats get their highest number of seats since 1929. But turnout is the lowest since 1918. Just a few hours after Labour secured a second consecutive full term with a massive majority, William Hague took the decision to step down as leader of the Conservative Party. In the closing days of the campaign, he had promised to take personal responsibility for the election outcome. Speaking outside the Conservative Central Office a short time ago, Mr Hague delivered this speech. I've led this party for four years, have always considered it a great privilege, and have actually enjoyed every single day. I believe strongly, passionately in everything that I've fought for. But it's also vital for leaders to listen and parties to change. I believe it's vital that the party be given the chance to choose a leader who can build on my work, but also take new initiatives and hopefully command a larger personal following in the country. And I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party 
when a successor can be elected in the coming months. I will continue until that time to carry out the parliamentary and other duties of the Leader of the Opposition. Some colleagues have urged me to stay on for a period so that the party can reflect at greater length. But it will in any case take some weeks for a successor to be elected under our new leadership election rules and the process cannot start until a new chairman of the 1922 committee has been chosen. A longer period would leave the party with a caretaker leadership for too long and I believe a new leader must be elected in time to prepare for the party conference in October. Joining us now from Conservative Central Office is our political correspondent Nick Robinson. Well, Nick, those dramatic scenes happened just 15 minutes ago. Who is the likely successor? We simply don't know the answer to that, Sophie. All bets are off for one reason. No one expected to wake up this morning and found that the Conservative Party had gone precisely nowhere in four years. To be in exactly the same position, even though they weren't in government, even though objectively they'd not been so divided, even though many people thought they'd fought a competent campaign. No one expected that. So it's not just a question of who the Conservative Party will want to lead it, but who would want the job, particularly when they might never become Prime Minister, just as William Hague has had to lead his party through four years of criticism and never become Prime Minister. Of course, we know the top names, Michael Portillo. Will he want the job, though, given the personal criticism he's come under from the Tory right for having shifted his views and for his homosexual past? Will he want it? Anne Widdicombe, will she want it? Watch Ian Duncan Smith, though, the shadow defence spokesman, popular with Margaret Thatcher, right wing, a good speaker. He could be a very strong candidate for this job. There's many weeks to go yet, and there's some debates for the Tory party to be had. Remember, Margaret Thatcher became leader. No one expected her to in 1975. So just because you've not heard of someone doesn't mean they won't become Tory leader and doesn't even mean they won't one day be Prime Minister. Four years ago, William Hague said he thought he could change the party. He went out listening to people all across Britain. That clearly has not worked. What a task for a successor. Well, exactly what a task. He believed, you see, that it was about division in part and therefore he came up with a new policy on the euro that 70 or 80 percent of his party could agree with and ensured that he only appointed people to his front bench that agreed to. He thought it was also about having a new, more modern party organisation and he thought it was about not having been in office because people had grown sick of them. Now most Tories agree it's something much, much more fundamental than that, that Labour now is posing in exactly the way the Tories did as the economically competent party, as the competent that cares, as Tony Blair always puts it, as well as is competent. And they know, these Tories, that they have to get back on that ground. They have on health and education and transport to look as though they've got better ways of solving the problems of those great public services than Labour. They know they've got to look as though they're in touch with Britain as it is. Uh, happy for women to work as well, well as to be mothers, happy for Britain to be multiracial, happy too that there are people of different sexual orientations. Those are the tasks for a new Tory leader, as well as keeping all those people who like the Tory party as it is, not alienating them. It's no easy task. Nick Robinson, outside Conservative Central Office, thank you. The Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott said it was a sad moment for the Conservative Party, but that shouldn't distract from the government's victory. Well, it's quite a traumatic moment, and I think uh, as the leader of the Conservative Party, he has suffered a tremendous defeat, and he's made that decision, and it's not for us to intrude on what is the private grief in the Tory party. We got a very emphatic mandate as the Labour government to get on with the job we started, and that's what we'll do from today onwards. Well, with some results still outstanding, the projected results show Labour being returned to power with a majority of 167. That's just 10 less than four years ago. Labour has won 413 seats. The Tories, 164 so far, the same number as the last election. And the Liberal Democrats, 47. That's an increase of seven on the last time. Labour's share of the vote is around 42%, the Conservatives 33% and the Liberal Democrats 19%. But the turnout was the worst since 1918. Only around 59% of people turned out to vote. This morning we'll be an analysing the results, talking to leading figures in the main parties and bringing you election news from your area. First, this report from Breakfast's political correspondent, Carol Walker. 
Tony Blair received a hero's welcome from party workers and stars at Millbank Tower, Labour's headquarters. He's achieved the historic second term, which has been his burning ambition since he became Prime Minister and says he's won the battle of ideas. But the joy at victory is tempered by the warning signals of the low turnout and there is none of the euphoria of four years ago. Instead, he's stressing that Labour must now fulfil the expectations of the voters. Now is the time that the people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promised that we will do, and they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. Our mandate is to carry on the work that we started, to be sure that on the foundation of a strong economy, delivered by a brilliant Chancellor, that we end up investing... that we invest in our schools, in our hospitals, in our transport, in the police, in our streets. By the time William Hague arrived at his count at Richmond in Yorkshire, he'd already conceded defeat. He'd admitted it was a deeply disappointing result for the Conservatives and indicated that he was already weighing up that decision on whether he should try to remain party leader. Clearly, we in our party must review redouble and intensify our efforts to provide an alternative government for the country in the future. I will set out my views later this morning on how that process should begin. His decision to stand down leaves huge questions as to who will want to take over his defeated party. The Liberal Democrats have been celebrating their best ever night. They seized Chesterfield from Labour, a seat that was held for so long by Tony Benn, who stood down at this election. Their leader, Charles Kennedy, said the night's results were a verdict not just on the government, but on the opposition too. It is also a doubly historic night for the Liberal Democrats in that we have, in all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago, and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole, and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. One of the biggest surprises was a personal landslide for retired Dr Richard Taylor, the independent candidate in Wire Forest, who'd fought a ferocious campaign against the downgrading of his local hospital. You, the way I view this is a tremendous reaction from the people against a very powerful government against a very powerful political system that overrides the will of the people. In Oldham, the contest was dominated by the recent race riots. Though the Environment Minister Michael Meacher held Oldham West and Woyton, Nick Griffin of the British National Party won a record 16% of the vote. Candidates were banned from making speeches for fear of inflaming local tension, but Mr Griffin later claimed the result represented a protest by white people against racist attacks. Which way are we going? At Brentwood and Ongar in Essex, the former BBC correspondent Martin Bell failed to unseat the Tory Eric Pickles. The man in the white suit who famously defeated Neil Hamilton in Tatton at the last election is out of Parliament. But Sean Woodward, who famously defected from the Conservatives and has been given a rough ride in St Helens, held the seat comfortably for Labour. In Hartlepool, Peter Mandelson also enjoyed a substantial majority. The close friend of the Prime Minister, twice forced to leave the Cabinet, spoke of the inner steel that had helped him through when opponents said he was facing political oblivion. They underestimated Hartlepool and they underestimated me because I am a fighter and not a quitter. Tony Blair and his wife Cherie are now back inside number 10 Downing Street. While the Conservatives seek a new leader to lift them from the political doldrums, the Prime Minister is beginning work to appoint his new cabinet and bring about wider changes to the way his government is run. Carol Walker, BBC News. Well, in Scotland, the Conservatives have failed to... The party should consider they had a leasehold, not a freehold, of this constituency. And indeed, that is what it is, but the lease is lasting slightly longer uh, than I would have preferred.
The Tories also fell to win targeted seats in Eyre One, and in Eastwood. Three, but Galloway and Upper Nithsdale, the part of Scotland worst hit by foot and mouth disease, did give the Tories a taste of success. It came after a recount. Another recount in Perth saw the Scottish Nationalists beat the Conservatives by just 48 votes. The SNP have confirmed uh, as the second party of Scotland and that gives us a, a platform of which to advance to the Scottish parliamentary elections in two years' time. The Liberal Democrats had a successful night, holding on to their strongholds in the Highlands and the Borders. But it was Labour's night, keeping their tight grip on Scotland. Assad Ahmed, BBC News. Labour's success across the UK was reflected in Wales, where it's just lost one of the seats it won in 1997. The political map of Wales has changed little, with Labour taking 34 seats. Plaid Cymru 4 and the Liberal Democrats 2. Monmouth, the Conservatives' number one target in Wales, was held by Labour. The Tories again have no seats in Wales. Plaid Cymru supporters in the early hours of the morning celebrating with their hero Adam Price, who, as predicted, took the largely rural seat of Carmarthen Eastern to Never from Labour. But that victory at the end of a long night was as good as it got for the Welsh nationalists. Earlier they lost only small in the Isle of Anglesey to Labour. A huge shock and a clear sign that the expected Plaid Cymru surge on the back of Welsh Assembly successes two years ago wasn't going to happen. The Rhondda, Caffili and Isloin, all Labour strongholds in the South Wales Valleys, where Plaid Cymru had put in so much effort, stayed under Labour control, albeit with reduced majorities. With the Liberal Democrats doing well to hang on to the two rural seats of Montgomery and Brecon and Radnorshire, the big losers again in Wales are the Conservatives. Humiliatingly, by failing to take Monmouth, Wales has again failed to return a single Tory MP to Westminster. So Wales comes out of this election almost exactly as it went in. The Plaid Cymru challenge in the South Wales Valleys never really materialised. The Tories still have no MPs in Wales and Labour is still very much dominant. Widow Davis, BBC News, Cardiff Bay. Meanwhile, two IUC officers and a woman were injured last night after a gunman fired on a polling station at Draperstown in County Londonderry. It's understood the police fired one shot, but the attacker managed to escape by car. One of the IUC officers was wounded in the shoulder. His colleague was hit in the arm and the woman was shot in the leg. It's believed a Republican dissident group was to blame for the attack. And a reminder of the main news, William Hague has resigned as leader of the Conservatives. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, is back in London after returning from his Sedgefield constituency early this morning. Our political correspondent, Philippa Thomas, is out outside number 10 Downing Street. Now, Labour seemingly all-powerful, the Tories way down there in disarray, their leader gone. This time, Labour have no excuses, do they? Absolutely, they have to deliver. They said they had to deliver because Labour itself raised expectations during this campaign. But now you're right, with almost a vacuum on the other side of the House of Commons, what excuse does Tony Blair have? He really is in a commanding position, isn't he? Uh, and the work, we're told, will start very soon. We're expecting a trip to Buckingham Palace later this morning. Work on the Cabinet will begin within hours. And so Tony Blair has a lot to look forward to. But first things first, Fergal Parkinson looks back at his big night. I don't think we have that report actually from Fergal, as a matter of fact, Philip. But let me ask you something. Clearly, there are two kinds of challenges at the moment for the Prime Minister. First of all, public services, but a twin track, and that is leading to a referendum on the euro. Absolutely, and already we've heard business leaders calling for decisive action on the euro. They want to know what sort of timetable we might be talking about. They want to know whether there will be a referendum soon. We know that uh, many senior Labour figures, including the Prime Minister, would like to start being able to make the case for going into the euro, perhaps as early as at the TUC conference uh, this summer. So I think uh, soon, within a matter of weeks or so, they have to start preparing the climate uh, so that if there is to be a full debate and if there is to be a chance of persuading Britain to vote to join the euro, that does have to start very soon. Philippa, Philippa Thomas there outside number 10. Some microphones already set up outside the door. It's going to be a busy place today. It certainly is. Well, it was the Liberal Democrats who made the most overall gains. At their headquarters is our correspondent, Peter Hunt. Well, certainly a good night for them, Peter.
Yeah, I think they're very pleased here in the headquarters. They've achieved the two things they said they wanted to achieve, which is an increase in their share of the vote. That's for a longer term strategy in terms of their arguments about the voting system in this country. But they've also gained seats. They gained one from Labour, six from the Tories, and lost one themselves. They say they had a very ca simple campaign strategy. It was a very simple message which had resonance. You can't get something for nothing. They believe that people were bothered about public services and that they were prepared to pay increased taxation in order to achieve those improved public services. But interestingly, I think they They've had the four weeks that they had campaigning will pale into significance compared with the next four years where they're going to have to set out their stall as this um, principled opposition that they keep talking about in the next few days and weeks. They're going to have to put some flesh on the bones of that idea. It's certainly going to be difficult given the, the number of seats they've got in comparison to Labour. Well, precisely. I mean, that is the problem. They've always said that they would not numerically outnumber the Conservatives to become the uh, opposition party. But what they argue is that the Conservatives will implode their words. That's their words, not mine. And that they'll be indulging in infighting for several months. And so it's, the stage is left open for the Liberal Democrats to occupy that territory. But it is a difficult territory to occupy, given that they're in government with Labour in Scotland and Wales, and they agree with them on certain issues. So if they were to achieve that sort of aim, it'd be a very different sort of opposition to that which we're used to in this country. Peter Hunt, thank you. Now, throughout the election campaign, throughout the election, we've been uh, talking to using the wonders of modern video telephone technology to a panel of voters. Now, our video voters have told us how they voted and why. I voted Labour because Rome wasn't built in a day and they deserve another four years. I voted for Liberal Democrats because living in a safe Labour seat, I wanted to push for proportional representation. I voted New Labour to give them a second chance to see whether I can trust them in future, although I've been more agreement with Lib Dem proposals. And also they have given us a fair, stable economy which will improve the National Health Service. I voted Liberal Democrat because I'm strongly in favour of Europe and their uh, liberal attitude to social policies. And I'm appalled by the Conservative attitudes to Europe, immigration and social policy. And your emails have been flooding in to our usual address, breakfasttv at bbc.co.uk. A lot of them about people who didn't vote. Bill Morris, I have his message here on my screen, says, uh, I hope all those who choose not to vote don't whinge and whine about the state of the country. My belief is if you don't vote, you should lose the right to vote. We've also got one a question here from Jerry Taylor. In fact, is there a law on the amount of people who voted elections? Would a 25% turnout still be OK? He asks. In fact, at about 20 to 9, if you'd like to stay tuned, we're going to be talking to our political editor, Andrew Ma. He will be answering any questions you have. So get emailing now. If you want anything that you want answered, Andrew Ma will have the answers, we hope, for you. So Breakfast TV at bbc.co.uk, the address as always. Now, no election coverage is complete, of course, without Peter Snow. And this year, he has excelled himself with his virtual reality graphics. He's been looking at how the Conservatives have failed to make any inroads into Labour's huge majority. What an extraordinary night has been. There is William Haig with his ambition to climb these steps over all these seats of his opponents, up to number 10, and open the door. This is what happened in these seats. These are the Conservative Party's target seats. This is what happened, and this is our forecast, our final forecast of what happened. Only a very few of them, as you can see, going blue. All the other ones holding out. And when we bunch them all together, you can see because of the losses to the Liberal Democrats the Tories have made, they've only got one net gain down the bottom there. And we put that down now uh, in front of William Haig. And you will see that he is only managing to climb up the first step. Hardly managing to get up the first step. So there's William Haig there. Labour majority of 167, Con short by 164, hardly moving at all up that staircase to power. Our forecast then, at the end of the day, Labour on 413, down six. Uh, the Tories, 166 up just one, as you've said, which is now. The Liberal Democrats doing the best out of this, plus six, and the others down one. And just in case you think there's not much Labour on that map, let me just show you each seat as a disc. Each seat is exactly the same value. And just look what happens now when we swell those seats and spread them out. There you have now the Labour picture. You can see how totally now Labour dominates the country. It's Peter there telling us how it is. People all over Britain are waking up to the news of the Labour landslide. 
and the resignation of William Hague. Let's now go to our reporter, Julie Etchingham, who's in Stockton on Tees, to hear from some of the voters there. Julie. Hi there, Jeremy. Yes, we're at the marketplace in the middle of Stocks on Teaser, just setting up this morning. Before we have a chat to some of the voters from last night, let's have a look at a couple of the newspapers. Uh, Yorkshire Post, not quite from this patch, but we grabbed it this morning. It's another stroll for Blair. That's a picture of the, the Blair family out going to vote yesterday. And a look at the Northern Echo, which does uh, cover this area. Time to deliver. And that's certainly the great sense that we've had up here in Stockton North. A safe uh, Labour hold here. The last Conservative person MP to hold this seat was Harold Macmillan back uh, between 1924 and 1945. Well, let's talk to some of the voters here at the marketplace this morning. We have Sultan Ahmed, who's a Labour voter. Morning to you. Morning. Raymond Draper, who decided not to vote. We've got Mark Jones, who was a Tory voter, and also Tony Evans, who's president of the market uh, traders here. Nice, Tony Burns, rather. Thanks for joining us all this morning. You voted Labour. Happy to see the results there, Sultan? Yeah, very happy, yeah, delighted, yeah. And I hope they keep their promises now, whatever they promise we have for the election, and yeah, see what they do. Do you think you'll think very hard about the way you'll vote next time if they don't deliver yes, in the Yes, definitely I will, yeah, definitely I will. Well, they've been given a second chance now, so they should do uh, well. I hope they just sort the hospitals out and everything, and that's it. Um, uh, Raymond, if I can turn to you, the turnout here was down by some 14% in Stockton North. Yeah. You didn't bother to vote. Why not? Well, I feel that uh, by voting, uh, I'm just making myself look a fool because I have no real faith in the policies that the Labour government have and also that uh, if voting really could change anything they'd make it illegal. <laughs> okay thanks for that. Uh, now Mark you voted Tory, uh, Mr Higgs resigned this morning, what do you make uh, of the way your vote's gone? Well, it's a shame about that isn't it? it? shows you a bit of old talk, you know what I mean, but never mind. Did you think there was any chance of uh, Tories getting in up here or were you just uh, <laughs> crossing your fingers very firmly? Just crossing my fingers really, you can tell Labour was going to win, I think. So. Uh, Tony uh, Vans, you have uh, not going to tell us which way you voted. What did you make of the whole process that we've seen unfold over the last uh, several hours? Well, I think it may be uh, it, the, the, the massive majority that the Labour Party have got. I don't know that that's actually good for the country. I mean, time will obviously tell. Um, obviously, um, it's very disappointing for the, the Tories. Um, but I, I think the major concern would be the, the amount of people who actually did not vote this time. Indeed. Whether it, whether that's because the, the politicians aren't connecting with the people, whether it's the younger people, obviously time will tell. I'm sure the analysts will work out who didn't vote and why they didn't vote and uh, look forward to the future to make that happen. OK, gentlemen, thanks very much. Thank Quick you. straw poll there from Stockton Market. And now it's back to the studio. Thank you, thank thank you very so much. much. Now let's go to Declan Curry, who's at the London Stock Exchange. All eyes are going to be on the pound today. What's it doing? Uh, indeed they are, Sophie, and the markets are giving their verdict on Tony Blair's victory and on the resignation of William Hague by selling the pound to such an extent that within the last few minutes the pound has touched its lowest level against the American dollar in 15 years. This is where sterling is standing now, trading between 1 US dollar 38.14, 1 US dollar 38.19, but it had gone down as low as, at, for a fraction, 1 US dollar 37.95, its lowest since February 1986. The the reason they're selling the pound is this. The city has come to the view that Labour's big victory last night and the resignation of William Hague within the last hour means that the chances of an early referendum on entry to the European single currency are now more likely. And the city is thinking that if we do join up for the euro, we will do it at a much lower pound level than we currently have now. So the pound is being sold over the last couple of days. The selling continues this morning. On the share market, nothing happening. The city was expecting the big victory. The FTSE 100 currently down by just short of three points. Declan, thank you very much. Well, our Merlinside Conservative Central Office has fed a few bits of information out. Apparently, Mr Haig told 20 personal staff that initially, then the whole of uh, the Central Office, then lots of tears and high emotion. He told people not to be put off politics. The pendulum, he said, would swim back to them. Well, black skies for Mr Haig. What about the rest of us? Blue skies actually here in London, Jeremy. Lots of sunshine around. A little bit of thin high cloud you may just be able to make out behind me. Won't spoil the sunshine too much. And we've got a few other clouds puffing up now too. But it's not like this everywhere. In Manchester at the moment, it's pretty cloudy. And indeed, it's rather showery.
So although there's a good deal of dry and fine weather around at the moment in many areas, we do have those showers, particularly across northern Britain, a few showers stretching down through the Irish Sea and in across northwest England, one or two in Wales and into the Midlands, but most of the heavier showers are in the north. Now it's certainly worth taking the brolly out with you today if you are heading out because you could catch a shower pretty much anywhere, but they will be few and far between across southern England and southern parts of Wales. In fact, some places will stay dry here. They'll be most frequent across northern areas and they're going to merge together later on across western Scotland and Northern Ireland into a longer spell of rain. Now the pollen index in northern areas is still low but it is high across southern England and East Anchor. You're probably going to notice that. So it looks like it's going to be unsettled for the weekend and with that I'll hand you back to Sophie and Jeremy. Well, thank, thank you very much. Well obviously the big story this morning is William Hayes' resignation. We'll bring you plenty more on that after half past eight. Right now though, time to join our news teams across the UK. Good morning from Newsroom South East, I'm Nina Hossein. Well, overall, it was one of the lowest turnouts London and the South East has ever seen. The average in the capital was just 56%, some constituencies well below 50%. Last night, London and the South East looked like this, and now, well, as you can probably see, it's pretty difficult to spot the difference. Both the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives made gains, but the night belonged to Labour. Labour held on to nearly all the gains it made in the last election, including marginal seats like Finchley and Golders Green, Mrs Thatcher's old seat. And a swing to Labour in Enfield Southgate meant Stephen Twigg held on to the seat he took from Michael Portillo in 1997. The Lib Dems maintained their swathe of south-west London, a total of six seats in the capital. In Kingston and Surbiton, they managed to turn a 56-vote win into a majority of nearly 16,000. And in Guildford, the Lib Dems parted through the night after snatching the seat from the Tories. Lainey Malconi reports on how Charles Kennedy's party shored up its place in London's political scene. Davy Edward Jonathan, Liberal Democrat, 29,500... A victorious night for Ed Davey as he's voted overwhelmingly as the Liberal Democrat MP. In 1997, Kingston and Surbiton had the smallest majority in London, just 56. Now it's seen a 24% increase in the vote. Because it's such a positive result for Liberal Democrats, not just here in Kingston and Surbiton, but across London, across the South East, across the country, um, we're obviously on a bit of a wave. In defeat, the Conservative candidate, David Shaw, left the council chamber swiftly. Within minutes, his entourage was nowhere to be seen. Lainey Malkani, Newsroom South East. In fact, it seemed the Liberals' gains were often the Tories' loss. They simply didn't recapture the number of seats they were hoping for. But they managed to keep Labour hands off Uxbridge and Chipping Barnet. Outside the capital, Martin Bell, the man in the white suit, was kept out of Parliament by the Brentwood and Ongar MP Eric Pickles. But there were some gains. The Conservatives did well in Essex, taking Romford and Upminster in the London borough of Havering and winning Castle Point from Labour. In addition to deciding who will be their MPs, many areas have also been voting in local elections. Results on these polls will be declared throughout the morning and we'll have that information for you on our later programmes. Don't forget you can get all the latest analysis of the election results here in London and the South East in a special election programme at 9 o'clock this morning. And if you can't get to a television, there's also coverage on your local BBC radio station or on our website or on CFAX page 170. Just before we go, we'll take a quick look at the weather. Early sunshine will give way to sunny intervals and some light showers. Temperatures should peak at highs of around 18 Celsius. We'll be back in half an hour with that election special. Now, though, back to breakfast and Jeremy and Sophie. It is 8.31. Watching breakfast from BBC News. Main story this morning is that after the crushing defeat in the elections, Mr Haig has resigned as leader of the Conservative Party. We're going to be bringing plenty more on that story in the next half hour. Right now, Maura with a summary of all this morning's main news. Thank you. Good morning. And the Conservative leader, William Haig, has announced he's stepping down as leader after Labour won the general election by a huge majority. Mr Haig announced his de decision a short time ago, and in the last few minutes, the Shadow Home Secretary, Anne Widdicombe, refused to rule out standing for the leadership of the Conservative Party. With some results still outstanding, the projected results show Labour being returned to power with a majority of 167, just 10 less than four years ago. 
Labour has won 413 seats, the Tories 164, so far the same number as the last election, and the Liberal Democrats 47, an increase of seven. Labour's share of the vote is around 42%, the Conservatives 33% and the Liberal De Democrats 19%. But the turnout was the worst since 1918. Only around 59% of people turned out to vote. As the results were still coming in this morning, William Hague emerged from Conservative Central Office to announce that he was standing down. He said it was important for the Conservatives to be clear about the lessons from this second big defeat. And he said no man is more important than his party. I believe it's vital that the party be given the chance to choose a leader who can build on my work, but also take new initiatives and hopefully command a larger personal following in the country. And I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party when a successor can be elected in the coming months. Tony Blair received a hero's welcome from party workers and stars at Millbank Tower, Labour's headquarters. He's achieved the historic second term, which has been his burning ambition since he became Prime Minister and says he's won the battle of ideas. But the joy at victory is tempered by the warning signals of the low turnout and there is none of the euphoria of four years ago. Instead, he's stressing that Labour must now fulfil the expectations of the voters. Now is the time that the people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promise that we will do. And they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. Our mandate is to carry on the work that we started The Liberal Democrats have been celebrating their best ever night. They seized Chesterfield from Labour, a seat that was held for so long by Tony Benn, who stood down at this election. Their leader, Charles Kennedy, said the night's results were a verdict not just on the government, but on the opposition too. It is also a doubly historic night for the Liberal Democrats in that we have, in all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago, and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole, and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. When does the work begin? Tony Blair and his wife Cherie are now back inside number 10 Downing Street. While the Conservatives seek a new leader to lift them from the political doldrums, the Prime Minister is beginning work to appoint his new cabinet and bring about wider changes to the way his government is run. Carol Walker, BBC News. In other news this morning, eight Japanese children have been stabbed to death by a man wielding a knife who burst into their primary school. At least 20 other children, all aged between six and eight, were stabbed together with three teachers. The attacker is said to have made his way from classroom to classroom, slashing out indiscriminately with a kitchen knife. Police have arrested a 37-year-old man with a history of mental illness. James Lawson, the father who killed his mentally ill daughter, is due to be sentenced today at Maidstone Crown Court. He pleaded guilty in May to manslaughter with diminished responsibility after helping his suicidal daughter, Sarah, to end her life. Mr. Lawson and his wife claimed their 22-year-old daughter was failed repeatedly by the National Health Service. The FBI is investigating incidents of alleged sabotage of Boeing 737 passenger planes at a factory near Seattle. The company has stepped up security at the plant after discovering at least 10 incidents of suspicious damage to aircraft under construction. Last year, Boeing fought a bitter industrial dispute with its engineers, and in March, the company announced it would be moving its headquarters to Chicago. Well, in the United States, a federal appeals court has rejected Timothy McVeigh's request to delay his execution for the Oklahoma City bombing. He's due to die by lethal injection on Monday, six years after the bombing in which 168 people were killed. His lawyer has said McVeigh will not ask the U.S. Supreme Court to delay the execution. The result of the Irish Republic's referendum on the European Union's Treaty of Nice will be known today. Irish voters have been asked whether they accept the treaty, which permits the enlargement of the European unity. If they reject, it will be a serious blow to plans to allow more countries to join the EU. 
A pitch invasion disrupted play in last night's England versus Pakistan cricket match at Edgbaston. The players were forced to leave the field for half an hour as thousands of Pakistan supporters swarmed onto the pitch, mistakenly believing the game had been won. It was the first incident of its kind at an international cricket match in Britain. And that's the news for now. Back to Jeremy and Sophie. Laura, thank you very much. More now on William Hague's decision to step down as Tory leader. The former Conservative Home Secretary and European Commission Vice President, Lord Britton, joins us now from Westminster. Good morning. Good morning. Are you surprised? Uh, not surprised. Knowing uh, him as well as I do, he was, after all, my successor. I know he's a, a, a man of uh, strong personal judgment and determination and uh, he makes up his mind and he does what he thinks is right and he does it quickly and I think we have to respect that even those of us who, who, who would have thought uh, that uh, a longer period of reflection would be better uh, to choose the right person to succeed him if he was going to go but I think we have to thank him for the uh, strong campaign that he fought, even though I, of course, disagreed on aspects of it, in particular the European side of it, uh, and wish him well, whatever he does now. Is having such a short time to find a successor going to be damaging to the party, even more damaging to the party? Uh, it doesn't have to be damaging to the party. I think to choose a, a new leader at a time of shock is more difficult than to do so after a time of reflection. I think that what we have to do quickly, more quickly perhaps than is ideal now, is to learn the lessons of the election and then choose the right person to apply them. So I'd focus first, even in the few short weeks that we have before the leadership election, on what those lessons should be uh, and then uh, choose the leader in the light of that rather than start hawking personalities uh, today. So what do you think the lessons are then? I mean, there is well, not the much time to reflect, is there? No, there's a few weeks. You'd be surprised how quickly politicians can act. The main lesson is that the European, the Eurosceptic card was played for all it was worth in this election and uh, it was very easily trumped. Uh, the Liberal Democrats, uh, on the other hand, were the most pro-European party in favour of joining the single currency and they gained votes and they gained seats. And I think we've got to realise that although uh, public opinion polls show a majority against joining the Euro, that's a very soft view. People are strongly in favour of membership of the European Union. We have to start from scratch and recognise that the Conservative Party was the party of Europe. It took Euro Britain into the European Union. And I've seen from my experience as a Commissioner that handled the right way it is possible to get the European Union to move in a direction with which British and cons British Conservatives are comfortable. On it should be seen as an opportunity and not a threat. On a personal note for William Hague, this is obviously going to be a bitter, bitter disappointment for him. I mean, how hard has it been for him over the past four years? He, he has toughed it out all the way along, hasn't he? He's been a good performer in the Commons and everything, but how difficult has it been? It's been extremely difficult, and I think he deserves great respect for the way in which he did stand up to Tony Blair very effectively in the House of Commons and the way in which during this election campaign the odds were against him, he never gave up. And full marks for that, I think it's a, a great credit to him. He's a very tough and doughty campaigner, there's no question about that. He inherited a situation in which the Conservative Party had suffered a historic defeat. It was always going to be a very uphill struggle to get the party going on the road back again. And I think uh, he, he really has had a very difficult time. And I think one has to respect that and thank him for what he has done. What do you think he can do next? I mean, he's still very young and he's an ambitious man. Well, he's only announced his res resignation about half an hour. I think you ought to give him a, a little longer before casting him in new roles. But he's going to be wanting to do something pretty uh, important, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not going to want to sort of stand by and sit watching from the sidelines. Well, uh, I think uh, he'll have to decide exactly what he does want to do, but obviously he has huge ability, and I'm sure that that ability will be utilised, uh, and uh, obviously he's got a, a lot to give the country uh, and a lot to achieve for himself. Uh, but uh, for the moment, I think we ought to respect, even if we regret, the decision that he's taken. Lord Britton, thank you. Joining us now from Conservative Central Office is our chief political correspondent, Nick Robinson. Uh, Nick, talk of tears inside Central Office this morning. They really didn't think it was going to be this bad, did they? 
They certainly didn't. It's like a political bereavement here, Jeremy. They simply did not expect this to happen. They didn't expect that the party they've come to regard as a natural party of government simply loaning Downing Street to the Labour Party for a four short years. They simply didn't believe that the electorate would snub them again. Yes, they didn't think they'd win, but they did think they would make some gains. Many thought as many as 50. They certainly didn't believe they would wake up this morning to discover that the leader who they've grown to respect for his grit, for his courage, for his determination would also be leaving them. Nobody here can quite believe it. There are tears, there are looks of disbelief. There are people scratching their heads, wondering what on earth they can do next. Partly, they have to think about their ex-leader, soon to be, William Haig. Our political correspondent, Sean Lay, now looks back at the political career of William Jefferson Haig. Time for common sense. Time for common sense. Exactly. William Haig entered this election campaign as the underdog, with most observers saying it was near impossible for the Conservatives to close the gap on Labour. His advisers decided to take the campaign direct to voters. Despite Mr Haig's natural warmth, it was not enough. We will do it! William Jefferson Haig was born in Yorkshire, the son of a successful businessman. Educated at the local Comprehensive, aged 16, he took his first steps in politics, telling the Conservative conference what teenagers wanted. They want to be free, free from the government. The government, they think, should get out of the way. Don't intervene, don't interfere in their lives. The schoolboy could name every MP and their constituency. Twelve years later, he was one of them, entering the Commons in a by-election. Thereafter, progress was rapid. He backed John Major to succeed Lady Thatcher, was rewarded with a ministerial job, and in 1995 entered the Cabinet as Secretary of State for Wales. It was there he met his wife, Fionn. When the election defeat robbed the party of obvious successors to John Major, William Hay put himself forward as leader of the next generation of Tories, receiving the endorsement of Lady Thatcher. Acutely conscious that Tory membership was ageing and declining, Mr Haig launched a series of reforms and tried to promote a more modern and inclusive image of conservatism. More successful was a visit to the Notting Hill Carnival. People like to attach labels to you. There's the boy wonder, there's the young upstart, there's the young pretender. I think I can live with that. But the big challenge to Mr Haig came from the return to Parliament of Michael Portillo. Once the darling of the right, he too was now pushing an inclusive, socially liberal form of conservatism. At the same time, conservative success in the European Parliament elections suggested there was electoral value in a more traditional agenda, notably a hard line over the European single currency. I want us to be absolutely clear, we keep the pound. That became a core theme in the general election, but it allowed Mr Hayes' critics to accuse him of moving away from the centre ground of British politics. Ironically, it was the man seen as his chief rival who offered the warmest assessment of his leadership talents. Did anybody expect the vivacity, the energy, the sparkle with which he's performed all the way through this campaign? It's said that life begins at 40, the age at which William Hague's frontline career in politics may be over. He's only the second Tory leader in more than 100 years not to have reached Downing Street. Sean Lay, BBC News. Well, political career there, thus far anyway, of William Haig. Uh, Nick, uh, outside central office, uh, I don't really expect you to ask this, answer this question, but give us a few pointers if you can. Who and what comes next? Well, what's come next is easy. The Tories have a leadership contest, but not one like they've ever had before. Instead of MPs simply choosing the leader, the MPs will have an American-style primary. They may select from five, six, maybe even more candidates, and they will choose just two. And then those two candidates will go to all the members of the Conservative Party, one member, one vote, to finally choose their leader. Now who? Much harder. Michael Portillo, the obvious candidate, the charismatic candidate, but there's a problem. Does he want the job? He's looked as though he's enjoyed life outside politics after he left his seat, and would he now want to take on the job feeling that he probably wouldn't get to be Prime Minister in four or five years' time? Would he want to take the job with the personal attacks that he's been subject to in the past? Well, if not him, who then? Well, then you look at the ranks of people like Anne Widdicombe, or perhaps someone few will have heard of, but many in the Tory party are talking about, and the bookies are giving quite short odds on. Ian Duncan Smith, the Shadow Defence Secretary, he looks like Haig, but he's quite different to him. 
he might be the man to come through. And finally, what of Ken Clark? I doubt he can be elected, but don't rule him out from a role in this big race. Nick, they're outside central office. We're going to be talking a lot about this in the next few weeks. We are. Now, a reminder of this morning's main news. William Hague has resigned as leader of the Conservatives. He says he's going to step down in a short time and expects the successor to be in place by October. Well, meanwhile, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, is back in London after returning from his Sedgefield constituency early this morning. Our political correspondent, Philippa Thomas, is outside 10 Downing Street. Philippa, now they really have to deliver. They do. Tony Blair has another five years in office and given the scale of his majority this morning, it could be another two terms. It's both a political dream, isn't it, and quite a daunting prospect. Now, Charles Rhodes is looking at the prospects for a Tony Blair second term. Yeah. And what, what difference has it made with the <coughs> private company? Well, services, uh, services have got better. After initially opposing it, Jan Collins has been won over by the private management company that has been running her council estate for the last 18 months. She says she'll support Tony Blair's plan to increase privatisation as long as it works. And for the second term, if elected, we want to accelerate the pace of change because without it, we will never build world-class public services for Britain. If he's going to do what he's saying he's going to do and it's going to improve the service, not just doing it for change's sake. This is a big mandate for that, for investment and change in our public services. They know that the state of our health service is not as good as it needs to be, and they want us to make the changes necessary to get there. With pledges to improve public services and continue the work begun to tackle poverty, Labour won over those who voted. But now it has a second term in which to deliver better hospitals, schools and welfare services. And I think that Labour's advisers and ministers are waking up this morning with a sort of sense of euphoria about having won the election. Uh, but actually that's when the anxiety begins because they know that if they don't really make a difference in the next couple of years, then they're going to be in trouble in the polls in four or five years' time. Private companies are already building hospitals, running prisons and schools in a race Labour hopes will help it make up for years of underinvestment in public services. But last night's sensational defeat of a junior Labour minister by a retired doctor campaigning against Labour's closure of Kidderminster Hospital is a warning that Labour still has to persuade voters its controversial use of private money will deliver better health services. I think in the second term, Labour clearly has a problem of making the public services better, but there then will arise, in a sense, a bigger question, which will be for the government but also for the British public. Are we willing to pay the taxes to make those services as good as our continental neighbours? During the past few weeks, Tony Blair has repeatedly asked the electorate to give him the tools to finish the job he began four years ago. Now, with an election victory which should give Mr Blair a second full, unprecedented term in power, he has what he wants. And this time, he won't be able to duck questions about whether his government is delivering on its promises. Charles Rhodes, BBC News. Now, Philippa, what about a, a pros uh, the prospect of a reshuffle? How soon could that happen? I think that could, ha could happen within hours, actually. What we're expecting is that Tony Blair will first go to Buckingham Palace. He doesn't have to. He's continuing as Prime Minister, but I think we expect him to pay that courtesy visit. And I think the Cabinet reshuffle is probably already drawn up and will be uh, going on over the next few hours. We may have the main names by the end of the day. And we have heard a lot of speculation already about, for example, David Blunkett moving into the space uh, for Home Secretary, uh, having a responsibility for the very important shake-up of the criminal justice system. The other key position to watch, I think, is education. If Mr Blunkett moves on, will Estelle Morris move up to take his place? And, of course, Alan Milburn at Health, uh, that's expected to, to carry on like that. They will be the three key posts if Tony Blair is to deliver that radical reform of public services. Philip Thomas, outside number 10, thank you. Well, the election in Northern Ireland was marred by two policemen being heard in a shooting in County Londonderry last night. It seems the dissident Republican group, the real IRA, were to blame. The results of the election are not expected until this afternoon. Joining us from Belfast is our Northern Ireland correspondent, Dennis Murray. Dennis, first of all, tell me about the shooting. 
Well, it happened at a polling station in the village of Draperstown in County Londonderry at about a quarter to ten just before the polls closed. And there was quite a crowd of people there apparently queuing to vote. And a gunman just came through the crowd, uh, shot and wounded the two police officers, but also wounded a woman who was in the queue. Uh, one of the officers managed to fire a shot in return, uh, but nobody was hit. And we've just been hearing that there have been a couple of arrests. Uh, the police, the RUC, are in no doubt that this was the work of Republican dissidents and it's been roundly condemned on all sides as an attack on democracy. I mean, somebody was saying uh, the people in that queue had a right to vote, a right to democracy, and a right to life, and uh, all those rights were violated by the gunmen. Dennis, what kind of impact do you think the, the elections might have on the peace process? Could have a tremendous impact. We had local elections here yesterday as well, uh, and you might have uh, quite different sets of results between the general election and the local election. Uh, some people have been saying that there's been tactical voting, uh, in other words, pro-agreement voters, perhaps unionists voting for the SDLP in constituencies like West Tyrone in order to try and keep out a Sinn Féin candidate, uh, but then they would return to, be, uh, to voting Ulster Unionist uh, as their first and second preferences uh, in the local election. I, I think it, it's one of those the old Macmillan events, dear boy events. Uh, there will be negotiations after these elections, probably starting about the 18th, which will be chaired by the Northern Ireland Secretary John Reid and the Irish Foreign Minister Brian Kahn. Now, the Northern Ireland office say they don't have any sort of pre-planned format for those talks, but there will have to be some discussions uh, clearly on issues, the, the vexed question of the decommissioning of paramilitary weapons, for instance. Was Mr Trimble hoping to strengthen his position or was he worried by dissident unionism? Oh, deeply worried by the Democratic Unionist Party, but if you remember, uh, he handed a letter of resignation as First Minister uh, to the Speaker of the Assembly to take effect on July the 1st, and what that did was to change the campaign here. Uh, Ian Paisley's Democratic Unionists wanted to make it a campaign about what David Trimble hadn't delivered, for instance, decommissioning, and what David Trimble did with that was to make it a campaign about devolution, which he has delivered and which is very, very popular. So he's looking to win back a couple of constituencies. He'd probably lose one or two, but uh, what he needs to do is he needs to win North Down from Bob McCartney, the sitting independent MP, and he's hoping to hold Strangford against a very strong push uh, from Iris Robinson of the DUP there. And I think if he if he does win those two seats, then he'd probably have a very good election. Dennis, tell us about the, the timetable for what's going to happen later on in the day in terms of results. Because we had the local elections, what's going to happen is they're going to open all the local government boxes first and take out any of the general election ballot papers that may have got mixed up in it. And the chief electoral officer here has been saying he reckons that'll take about two hours in the count centres. So the count here won't actually start till about 11 o'clock this morning. And we're expecting the first results maybe mid to late afternoon. But also I think people are expecting recounts in some of the constituencies, places like West Tyrone, for instance, where there is that battle uh, between the SDLP and Sinn Féin with the Ulster Unionist candidate as well. Uh, so some of the results mightn't be until quite late tonight, 8, 9 o'clock, maybe even later if there are recounts. Dennis Aaron Belfast, thanks for joining us. I'd just like to say apologies to all those of you who've written in with questions for Andrew and Marr. We plenty were, of you have. Well, plenty of you have. We were going to be talking to him, but as I'm sure you'll understand, events have meant that we no longer have any time to. Events, dear boy, events. Let's have a look at the weather now with Sarah. Thanks, Sophie. A good morning. Well, it's a gorgeous start to the day here in London. Plenty of sunshine around, a little bit of thin high cloud behind me. That's down towards the south. It shouldn't spoil the sun too much. And a few other clouds are now starting to build up a little bit. Now, there is a lot of fine weather around across much of the United Kingdom at the moment, but there's more cloud across northern Britain, a few showers too, and a band of showers stretching in towards parts of northwest England. Now, generally through today, the clouds will build up, bringing a scattering of showers to many of us, but most of the showers will be across the north. That's where they're going to be heaviest, down across central and southern England and much of south Wales. Those showers will be much fewer and further between, and in fact, some places will stay dry. Now, later on this afternoon, it looks like thicker cloud will stretch in towards parts of western Scotland and Northern Ireland, bringing some more persistent wet weather. Now the temperatures are still a little bit disappointing for this time of year, it has to be said, around 11 to 14 degrees for Scotland, for Northern Ireland, 16, maybe 17 across England and Wales, but the winds are lighter than yesterday and in the sunshine it shouldn't feel too bad. Now tonight we are going to see some wet weather heading down from the northwest and that wet weather will still be around during tomorrow, just slowly trundling towards the south, although it probably won't reach southeastern parts of England until late in the day. Once that rain clears away from northern Britain, it'll brighten up a little bit, but there will still be some showers and temperatures tomorrow will again be fairly disappointing at around 15, 16 or 17 degrees. Then on Sunday, again, we're looking ahead to a day of sunny spells and showers. Now it looks like the heaviest, sharpest showers will be in eastern areas. Some western parts will stay generally dry and bright throughout the day. Again, quite a cool day to come. 
Now on Monday it looks like the wind will be fairly light so it shouldn't feel too bad in the sunshine. Temperatures may be up to 18 degrees in places and also the showers will be lighter and more scattered. And then on Tuesday again there will be a few showers around but again they'll be a little bit lighter. We should see temperatures up to 18 or 19 degrees in the south and in the sunshine and in a light wind that shouldn't feel too bad. So to recap, it looks like it is going to be quite unsettled and cool over the next few days. Plenty of showers around throughout the weekend. Those showers fewer and further between next week. Sarah, thank you very much. Well, it has been an historic night. Labour have won an unprecedented second full term. The Conservatives, though, have lost a leader. And the Lib Dems have had their best result for more than 70 years. All the party leaders have been giving their reactions. It's indeed a, a night of history for our party. But the one thing that we have to remember is that now is the time that the people of this country want us to serve them, want us to do the things that we promise that we will do, and they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. And I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party when a successor can be elected in the coming months. I will continue until that time to carry out the parliamentary and other duties of the leader of the opposition. In all likelihood, built on the amazing breakthroughs of four years ago and we've taken ourselves further forward across Britain as a whole and we are very much the party of the future for British politics. Election coverage continues at nine o'clock with 30 minutes of news from around the UK on BBC One and the latest on William Hague's resignation on News 24. But we'll finish today with a look back at some of the images of the past 12 hours. From all, all of us here at breakfast, goodbye. Goodbye.